Good morning to everyone and welcome to this uh, Housing and Communities Committee for the 31st of May 2021. I'm afraid slightly delayed because of IT problems, but we're here and we're ready to go. May I welcome you all. Uh, as, I, as as you may recall, we had a meeting in February uh, this year and I, I hoped at that time that we would be able to get this meeting uh, for the 31st of May and fortunately I was uh, correct and had a good uh, prediction on that. We are, however, still virtual uh, and that is unfortunately the nature of the beast. As such, could I remind everybody to keep your microphones on mute unless you are speaking. I'd like to take this opportunity to introduce the virtual top table. Uh, and I have with me today Councillor Chris Ahern, who is the Vice Convener, uh, Barbara Renton, Executive Director, Communities, Claire Mailer, Deputy Director, Communities, Christina Flynn, Democratic Services Manager, and Adam Taylor, who is with Committee Services. For the proceedings today, if I may remind you all to uh, use the chat function to uh, attract my attention. Obviously, as usual, queue for question, see for comment, and if officers will put A if they wish to, to answer. Then I ask, do we have any apologies at this time? Uh, no, we've not had any apologies for this morning, convener. Thank you very much. Then could I ask you, um, Mr Taylor, if you could do a roll call so we have a, a list of who's present for the minutes. Yeah, sure, no problem. OK, councillors, when I call your name, if you can just indicate that you're present in the meeting. Uh, Councillor Ahern? Present. Councillor Bailey? Present. Councillor Liz Barrett? Present. Councillor Peter Barrett? I'm here. Uh, can we I'll just pass you because I know you're here. Um, Councillor Illingworth? Present. Councillor Jarvis? We think Councillor Jarvis was having some IT issues this morning, so she may join us later. Councillor Massey? Present. Councillor McCall? Present. Councillor McEwen? Present. Councillor Shires? Present. Councillor Stewart? Present. And Councillor Waters? Present. OK, that's everybody here, convener. Thank you very much. And so hopefully uh, Councillor Jarvis can join us as and when. Um, <clears throat> before we proceed, there's a little bit of housekeeping just to do on this occasion. Um, regarding, with respect to the fire service, I'd like to welcome local senior officer Stephen Wood uh, to the committee. This was going to be his first meeting, I believe. Uh, he has now taken over from Gordon Pride, who was a regular with us at this committee. Um, and I would ask if we can minute our thanks uh, for all his work with us. Secondly, this is going to be the last committee for Chief Superintendent Todd, as he's decided it's time now to retire after some 30 years of service. Uh, he has, I believe, spent most of his time in the Grampian region and was part of the uh, organisation to set up Police Scotland in his time. Uh, I won't reveal his age. We had a chat before the meeting started, so I mentioned that. But of course, uh, in good Hollywood tradition, this is where he takes the decision to become a private detective and solve all the cases for the police and become rich and famous. Uh, that's just a suggestion, of course. Uh, if you do take that up, of course, you'll need to have a, a gimmick and I would suggest lollipops or a crumpled raincoat. Uh, I don't think anybody can remember that that far back. Uh, and I would suggest that I have probably lost half the committee and half the officers by this point, so we'll, we'll leave that one alone. Um, seriously, I am sure that everyone will join me in thanking you for your service and to wish you a long and happy retirement. But of course, you have to get through today first. Finally, if I may, I'd like to offer congratulations to Elaine Ritchie, who has now taken over the role of senior service manager for the housing team. And I have no doubt we will see her more at committee, probably on this top virtual table. One last thing to mention, um, we have quite a full agenda this morning uh, and depending on how time flies, I will um, suggest a comfort break at some stage during the morning. Next item, may I ask if there are any declarations of interest today? And if you could type DI in the chat box, I would appreciate that. And nothing coming through. So may we ask, may I ask if we can uh, uh, approve the minutes of the meeting of the 3rd of February 2021? I'm assuming there's nothing coming through. Yes. Approved. Thank you very much. There's no other comments in the chat box. I'm assuming we've all agreed to that. So we need to move on to the agenda in full. At the moment, um, 
because of the operational demands, uh, I have agreed that we can see item four three first. I hope we're all in agreement with that. That's the matter regarding Police Scotland's criminal justice remodelling programme. Uh, as you recall, this uh, came up at a briefing on the 17th of May, uh, and it was suggested that we should, because some people had internet problems as well, uh, have this scrutinised at this committee, which is the appropriate committee to consider it. Um, I'm going to ask Chief Superintendent Todd and Superintendent Mertes to give a verbal report first of all, just to remind you of the situation. May I remind members, however, that this is a briefing. It's not a consultation. Uh, the decision on to do this, as and when, is a police matter, it's an operational matter. Uh, they are merely briefing us of what's happening. So if I can uh, hand over now to Chief Superintendent Todd and Superintendent Mertes to give us a quick verbal briefing. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. I'll, I'll just take um, five minutes or so just to run through um, the situation as we have have it just now um, and I appreciate there'll be a range of views which, which we absolutely welcome um, but I want to ensure that those views are founded on established information so if you members can bear with me th this relates to primarily our custody facility with currently within Perth and the reclassification of that custody facility um, from the current um, status that it has to, to a new status. This is part of a normal process of ongoing annual review. There's nothing fresh or new in this and we're not the only local authority area that's going through this reconsideration. The actual proposal itself went to what's referred to as the Police Scotland Joint Negotiating Cons Consultative Committee, GNCC, on the 14th of January. That's when this process of consultation um, began with, with the interested uh, parties and it's expected that we'll return to that group around June time, so next month, and if changes, and, that, and I stress the word, if changes are made, then they will be implemented around the September time of this year. So the, the proposal in simple terms is the Perth Custody Centre is reclassified from a primary to an ancillary custody centre, and I appreciate there's an element of technicality around that, which is appropriate that uh, I spend some time just uh, um, um, making members aware. But what is really critical is the custody facilities at Perth are not being closed, they are not being decommissioned, and any assessment to the, uh, to the contrary it, it is not founded on the information. It's also, this, the uh, will not impact at all on the Perth building itself. Perth building um, remains as it is, working as it is just now, so there's no uh, impact upon that. So the, the purpose the purpose of this review is to make sure that we have better outcomes for people in custody and return police officers to the front line. There's a really strong focus on how we look after, manage and support people who, who are in custody. And I'll come on to some of the detail around that, but there are some basic principles of custody and I could run through half a dozen article rights under ECHR law, which we require, not least of which is right to life but also the right to a fair trial and no punishment without law. And that latter one is a quite a critical um, element for us in so much as the days of holding people in custody just because we could until the next lawful day uh, are long, long since passed and, and rightly so. There's a tremendous amount of scrutiny and audit and assessment is wrapped around whether or not we keep somebody in custody. We'll bring them into custody to facilitate criminal justice arrangements, so that can be an interview, photograph, fingerprint, DNA, but it's very unlikely that we'll keep them in custody unless there's a very strong reason for doing so. And those are enshrined not just in the Human um, Rights Act, but also under the Criminal Justice Scotland Act of 2016, which importantly um, has a presumption of liberty built in into it. So there's a presumption that people will not be held in custody um, and they are they are released. The consequence of that, of course, is that there's far less people in custody now than we've ever had before. Um, and as a consequence of that, that, so if I gave some figures to, to members, that in 20, 2008 and 2009, um, we had 18,000 people in custody in Tayside. Last year we had 7,800. So members can see that the, the reduction in the volume of people going through these, these facilities. Um, I know 55% of the people we took to Perth uh, were less than four hours, so they were in, in and out. So of that 7,800, very few of them. Our capacity to hold people within Tayside 
can be met fully from within the facility in Dundee. And what that provides us with is the opportunity through our colleagues in criminal justice to build what's being referred to as criminal justice hubs, which focus far more upon the welfare, the well-being, diversionary tactics around individuals that we bring into custody, all of which um, needs a, a focused effort. And however, as we mentioned back in the 17th, we put staff from our front line into custody suites all of the time to what we refer to as backfill. Custody division was never designed with enough resources to actually deliver the service. So we've got a custody suite in Perth that's being kept open with staff off of the front line, not taking in custodies. So we can see the sense of that, that there comes a point where we have to review and consider, can we do our business differently? So the ancillary facility allows us to do that. It can be stood up at any moment in time. It can be planned to be stood up if we had an event such as um, the, the cup final, uh, where we put the custody facility uh, live, put resources in there and made it available for because we planned there may be the potential to bring custodies in and on that occasion. Clearly, custodies can still be brought in by staff themselves, um, but processed slightly differently. And that has to be the right type of custody um, with the right risk assessment wrapped around them. And there's some innovative work that Susie's team are doing to allow us to do some remote supervision um, of those custodies. So ultimately, the look and feel of the custody suite to the community in Perth and Kinross shouldn't look that different because the facility remains open. What we're not doing is staffing it 24-7 to hold custodies 24-7 because simply we don't have 24-7 custodies of that volume coming through and we can move them to Dundee to allow them to be held there. So I appreciate that's a very quick run through um, of the information that we have and what our proposal is. And I'd be grateful, Chair, at your discretion to answer any questions that members may have. Thank you, Chief Superintendent. Um, I'll open up now to questions. I'm not seeing any coming through at the moment. No. I'm not sure if my chat function is working, but I'm not seeing any good. First question is there. Council Barrett, Peter Barrett, over to you. Um, thanks, uh, uh, con Convener. Um, and can I say, um, Andrew, be very sorry to see you uh, move move on or, or, or re retire. And thank you for your, your contribution to uh, Perth and Kinross uh, and making it a, a, a safer place. Um, you said that the consultation um, started in, 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 in January. Um, can you tell me what's the, 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 the closing date um, for the, 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 the consultation? You said that implementation could be from um, sub September. Um, and other than the ancillary um, facility, you know, what, what options are there? Um, either is it, is it keep it as it is or, or move to an ancillary um, facility? Yes, yeah, th thank you, Councillor. I'll take the second point first and I'll ask Susie to comment on the first one in a moment. So our option, this is an annual review that criminal justice services undertake every year. As I said, there's nothing innovative here. We've, we've done this in numerous locations before across the country and we're not the only local authority area where this consideration is happening. So there's, there's effectively three options, Well, there's effectively four options. We could close it in its entirety. That's not an option that's on the table. And I don't think I would support that as divisional commander. I, and as I say, that's not on the table as a proposal. So every year we can make the assessment of, do we maintain it as is? Do we move it to weekend opening? And there is only one in the country as it currently stands, although there's consideration to revert that to an ancillary facility, but convert another one to weekend opening, both of those within the Glasgow area, uh, or to move to the ancillary. So effectively, as it is just now, which I don't consider to be viable based upon the numbers we have, weekend opening, uh, we can to all intents and purposes do that. We have done it over previous weekends through the ancillary setup and ancillary itself. And then the final option is just to close it uh, again. That is not on the table and not something that I would review. So if numbers were beginning were to rise again because the facility is maintained, we can open it back up again and make the assessment that actually there's less efficiency uh, in doing what we're doing. It would be more efficient and more productive and safer for our custodies if we stood the facility back up. We can we can review that again um, on an annual basis. So I'll pass to Susie on the actual consultation. Clearly, this affects police staff with terms and conditions. Um, and so there's a, there's a, there are some legal ease wrapped around that, but I'll pass to Susie for that. Thank you. 
Uh, thanks, Chief Super. Yes, consultation began with staff in uh, in January, and I've been doing a number of uh, visits like this one today to other councils in order to explain to them the changes that are coming forward. In fact, after this meeting, I, I'm off to Midlothian to speak to them about one of their uh, facilities. Um, we're looking to um, get feedback by June uh, going into July for probably for another JNCC, that's our joint uh, national um, committee that we have with our staff associations, etc. And then we're looking to implement any changes um, that are agreed through that process in September. So, uh, as I say, happy to take feedback in and to take that into the considerations that will go to my uh, line managers, including the ACC, uh, who will be keen to, to hear back from um, the councils and get their feedback. Thank you very much. Uh, I have a question from Councillor McCall. Thank you, convener, and thank you, Chief Superintendent Todd, for that overview. My question really is about the capacity and the skills of the workforce in Perth station. Um, I take your point that it will still be able to spin up, I suppose, the custody suite if required. But currently there will be specialist custody sergeants, I'm assuming, or custody staff uh, employed at Perth station. So my question really is two parts. One, will they be retained in Perth or will they be moving to Dundee? And if any staff moves on who is a custody uh, trained member of staff, will that level of expertise be maintained within Perth Station? Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. So, so very important question, Councillor, and thank you for that one. Um, the days of untrained people processing custodies have long gone. Our um, obligations to, to the custodies that we bring in, the specialist nature of that area of business just absolutely necessitates that we keep that level of specialism. There are a number of officers trained within Perth that work on the front line who are qualified and will come into custody uh, as and when we need to process custodies. They are supported by, on occasions, inspectors that are, um, who are remote um, from them, but they, they will review their custodies. Sergeants will also accept some custodies. Constables can accept custodies at the right level both the correct level of supervision, which can be done remotely. So if we were to lose that skill from Perth, we would need to retrain it. And that's a constant ongoing to keep the skills of our establishment up so that we can provide that facility within Perth. As to whether or not the sergeants stay there or move, my understanding is the sergeants would move to, to Dundee, where they can provide more hands-on care to the higher risk prisoners, the ones that we keep for longer. Um, for court the next day. But equally, of course, when we want to stand up our facility, they would come back if that was required. But in any event, the sergeants can remotely um, supervise the, the custody arrangements as people are coming in using some of the technology that we've got available um, to us. So short answer is we won't be taking the skill away, um, but clearly we'll be shifting some capacity uh, to other areas. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Hearn, you have a question. Yes, thank you very much, convener. And uh, I'd like to just echo comments, um, Chief Superintendent, uh, about the work you've done for the communities in Perth and Kinross and also wish you a happy retirement. Um, I would just like to ask in your comments, in your opening statement, you said that we will turn officers to the front line, um, which will obviously be a positive um, effect for Perth and Kinross. But I just wondered um, with possibly a if somebody needs to be transferred to Dundee, we're going to take possibly one or two officers off the front line in order to facilitate that. And I just wondered if there's going to be a point where that is going to be um, counterproductive um, or whether it's it's um, been taken into account in terms of uh, what you've told us is going back to the front line. Thank you, Councillor. Yeah, there, there is a tipping point there where the, the benefits um, of improved service delivery, particularly to those we, we hold in custody, um, as well as the efficiency element of returning officers to the front line, not having them sitting in a custody suite in Perth with no custodies. But there's a tipping point where if things were to increase um, or we found that Dundee didn't have the capacity because we saw more custodies coming through the entirety of Tayside, then we would need to reverse this. Um, that would be my position and this goes through an annual review um, as we review our, our custody facility. So we will be keeping a very close eye on that and the processing time for officers in Dundee is more critical to me than the travel time. Um, I'm quite relaxed about the travel time given the distance between the two, recognising 
um, we're not just coming from Perth to Dundee, it's the wider Perth and Kinross to Dundee, but it's how long they, they wait as they process those custodies in, and that's a key um, performance indicator that we'll be keeping a close eye on. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. I'm not seeing any further questions coming through at the moment. Um, are there any comments from anyone? And no comment coming through either. Uh, so I, I'd just like to thank you both um, for coming back and uh, going through this again with us. Um, from my own point of view, I know that uh, many of my constituents, of course, are worried about the uh, lack of police officers that they see, and I hope that the frontline officers won't be affected uh, by this uh, this change. Um, I know people feel uh, that I've spoken to uh, continue to feel that the, the police are coming becoming more isolated from the public because the police stations are closing and the more officers are now in cars and vans by necessity because they have to get over such a wide distance. Um, so I hope that the, the plans you have will not take um, officers off the front line or not for too long anyway. And it seems to be our rural communities. I know that's a, that's a situation I have where I live up here. Uh, many of the, the constituency in rural communities are concerned that they, they very rarely see policemen around now, police officers, I should say. Um, obviously, there's not a comment about the officers themselves. Uh, that, that would be unfair. Uh, we know that they are committed to the work and do serve and protect the public. Uh, and I noticed in the paper this morning that there's a, been a 6% rise in assaults on police. Uh, because of the COVID situation. That has been a very difficult situation I know to deal with. Um, it's my, let's say, what I hear and what I, I note myself is that we just probably just don't have enough police officers available at any time. Uh, and that's not for our concern, that's something for the Scottish Government to sort out. And the, I feel that they are lacking the funding of lack putting the funding in uh, to allow the numbers of police officers to rise. Uh, that's a matter for them and I take them to task for that uh, and I will be writing to the Cabinet Secretary for Justice to raise my concerns that there just are not enough police officers in Scotland. Um, and with that, I will thank you Chief Superintendent Todd and Superintendent Murtis for your input on this particular subject. Uh, I know Superintendent Murtis, you've got to leave us now because you've got another another a, a meeting to, to arrive at. Um, so we now move on to the normal fire and police reports and I will hand over to the vice convener as normal to take those on. Thank, thank you, councillors. I'll, I'll duck out. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Superintendent. And thank you, convener. So we move on to item 4.1, which is the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service quarterly four performance report for 1st of January to the 31st of March 2021. And I ask uh, Stephen Wood and Ewan Baird to introduce the report, please. Good morning and thank you very much, Vice Convener. Um, before I ask members to scrutinise question and note the quarter four report, um, if I may, I would like to bring to your attention two upcoming consultations that the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service um, are launching shortly. The first one being on our future vision, which is a, a long term strategic um, aim that we're planning to set out, which should be going live from around early to mid June. Um, and the second consultation will follow on from this, which is around options for responding to automatic fire alarms. Um, I'll ensure that the committee have details of both consultations when they go live. Um, if I could now bring the committee's attention to page 18 of your pack, uh, which is page six of the report, um, the performance summary, which highlights the, um, the performance in quarter four and over the, the year to date, um, you'll see from the, the performance summary that 11 of the 12 indicators are uh, reporting a positive performance over the year, with one being um, unwanted fire signals having missed the target. Um, I'd like to bring Ewan Baird in now to talk in a little bit more detail around some of, some of the work that's been ongoing and some of the, the figures that you see in front of you. So um, Ewan, if I may. Good morning everyone. Uh, thank you Vice Convener and Stephen and what I'll do, I'll just go through some key parts of uh, the quarter four report. It's, uh, it's quite uh, refreshing to see the performance over the year, but just to give you a wee outline of what we do at the start of the year, we'll do a, we'll do a, a pre-planning uh, and we'll apply national reduction figures to each of our highlight indicators. The arrows that you'll see on that Stephen described there on page 18 of your pack uh, provides an indicator of how we are performing uh, on year-to-date figures. 
quarter four provides us with a full overview of a uh, the 2020-21 figures. Now moving on to uh, the performance highlights, I'll just go through some of the, the 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 highlight indicators to give you an indication of how we've been performing. Firstly, the number of accidental fires uh, continues to decrease in the long term, reporting one of the lowest year to date numbers of accidental fires in the three years. 98 incidents against an average of 110. The numbers during quarter four, which were 19, reflect the same decrease of the same quarter last year of 23 and the three year average of 22. And following on from that, there were no accidental fire fatal casualties during the year. The number of accidental fat, uh, non fatal casualties for quarter four is three, and this is equal to the three year average. But we've got to remember this includes on scene checkups, and during this quarter, we had two on scene checkups from the fire service and one from the Scottish Ambulance Service. So, again, very, very low numbers. The number of non domestic fires, which essentially is commercial fires, but also includes sheds and outbuildings. This is reflecting a decrease for this quarter, nine against a three year average of 15. And there were no non fatal casualties or fatal casualties reported within quarter four with regards to domestic buildings. The number of road traffic collisions for quarter four is reporting a decrease against the three year average for this quarter, which is 13 against 17. There is also a decrease on the same quarter last year and to the year to date figures. There was one fatal RTC casualty reported for this quarter, and that was from an accident up at Glen Shee at the very start of the year. Non fatal RTC casualties is reporting 10. The number of RTC casualties is the lowest for three years and for quarter and for this quarter and year to date. And we have seen a steady decrease over the years. And this could and the, the, the reduction we're seeing this year could easily be a, a result of COVID where there was less cars on the road uh, during both lockdown periods. The number of deliberate fires is, re is reflecting a decrease against the average. One incident against an average of eight. Year to date figures have decreased also and against an average uh, and uh, uh, of also against the average slightly 25 against 29. The number of deliberate secondary fires is also reporting a decrease for this quarter, 11 against an average of 14 and a larger decrease year to date figures 63 against 95. But generally without throughout Perth and Kinross, we do see low numbers eh, compared to other local authority areas. And lastly, I'll bring you on to the unwanted fire alarm signals, UFAS. They are caused by fire, fire alarms in non-domestic buildings and they report an increase, 140 against a three year average of 136. The year to date figures for 2021, 20, however, is slightly below average, 193 against Five, sorry, 593 against 597. We have, however, fallen short of a year to date target of 528, and that is probably the reason why uh, the arrow is red and pointing up the way. Now, during a review of uh, the UFAS, I did a further analysis of the figures to try and identify uh, the top reporters. And uh, I looked on past the three years and looked at the six top reporters, and these are residential care, secondary education, primary education, hotels, hospitals, boarding house accommodation. And these change slightly over the over the over the years. They they come and go with include office accommodation and uh, and also sheltered housing. But one of the things we have seen seen is a is a decrease on the top six reporters, uh, which indicates that the number out of the 
593 UFAS incidents we had during the year, there's a high, very high number of low risk premises that are uh, having fire alarm actuations. So is that that's some, one of the things we're going to have to focus our activities on. So moving on to uh, page 32 in your pack. Uh, and look at the community safety engagement programmes. Now, due to the COVID restrictions, a lot of our activity has been done on a, using social media platforms, and you'll see the sort of a activity that we've been getting involved in through our thematic action plan, supporting the road safety framework, and also our a national Make a Call campaign. But one of the things that we did a lot of pre-planning for was for the, the COVID testing. And uh, you'll probably be more than aware that we're actually utilising fire stations within Perth and Kinross for that. And these fire stations are Perth Fire Station, Kinross, Aberfeldy and Ochterarder. Uh, so there's a lot of pre-planning going into that and that was in during quarter four. And uh, to date they've been very successful and are still continuing. Uh, a couple of the notable incidents we had during this this period in quarter four, as you know, we had a very cold, cold winter, and this led to uh, quite a few road traffic collisions. One of the most uh, serious ones we saw here uh, was with two two heavy uh, heavy goods vehicles, a grit truck hitting a, a Walburton's bread lorry. This inst incident occurred on the A91. Both drivers were successfully extricated from the vehicles using platforms and hydraulic cutting equipment. And uh, fortunately, this was a multi-agency response and Police Scotland were able to provide a safe working area by closing the road. But you'll see the pictures how challenging that, uh, that incident was for us all. And another one, uh, quite a, a large and protracted fire at Bramble Bank Mill in Rat Rattray Blair Gowrie. This was a derelict mill, one of the old mills that runs up the river. We were there at quite an ex, uh, for quite an extensive time. A number of fire appliances there, and the fire is thought to be started deliberately. So that gives us an overview of our quarter four performance and our year-to-date figures. And uh, Stephen and I would be happy enough to take any of your questions. Thank you very much. Now open it to questions for the quarterly report. I don't see any. Oh, Councillor Barrett. Peter Barrett. Uh, thanks very much, Vice Convener. Um, I wanted to ask a question with regard to page 11 um, of the, the, the um, Scottish Fire and Rescue Service report, and that was with regard to um, the conduct of um, remote fire safety um, audits. Um, I just wondered if you could describe how, how these are, are, are carried out and how effective they are. Thank you. Thank you. So Ewan, I'm happy to take that question. Uh, thank you very much, Councillor, for the question. Um, the, the remote audit procedure came about um, towards the start of the first lockdown, when obviously the, the impact on care homes was significant, and care homes forms one of our key, um, key premises within our audit framework. Um, we were unable to attend care homes for obvious reasons, and we, we sought to continue dialogue with the, the duty holders and to continue to offer advice and support in keeping all the residents safe. So we ran a couple of pilot projects across several areas, uh, Perth and Cross being one of those, and we developed um, a suite of questions very similar to the physical audit that we undertake. And we were able to do a lot of that um, over the telephone. We were getting information and uh, risk assessments sent through uh, email to us. And it, it, it takes a little bit longer to do. It takes a little bit more organisation but essentially the, the question and the scrutiny, uh, the examination of the, the paperwork and the support that officers can provide uh, guidance along um, very often some basic measures that improve safety. Um, it, it's all very similar. Um, we've, we've done it extensively across the country uh, and it, it's also we're, we're finding that it's 
it's given us a sort of secondary benefit and sometimes there is considerable length of time spent traveling to premises um, and we, we do the high risk premises on, on an annual basis. We are looking currently at whether it, it would be appropriate that we can do some of these uh, more remote areas, um, continue with the remote audit procedure and maybe intersperse that with a physical visit every every other year. So whilst it's quite early days, the bulk of the audits that we've done through the lockdown periods, particularly in those higher risk uh, care facilities, have been remote. Um, the feedback from both duty holders and the auditing officers has been good and it, it's just allowed us to maintain that level of um, support throughout the process. So um, we'll continue to work to develop that, continue to use the technology and, and we're hoping to move towards some kind of um, virtual audit as we go with you know using iPad so we get a physical walk around the building as well. So um, it, it's been a really positive outcome um, some significant benefits from it and I think we'll, we'll continue to, to develop that as we all become more more used to using the technology available to us. OK, thanks very much. Thank you. Are there any more questions? No. Right, thank you very much. Are there any comments on the report? I don't see any anybody requiring a comment. In which case, thank you very much. Right, Vice Convener, could I just come in with a, a supplementary question, um, seeing as no one else is. Um, on page 10 of the report, um, there's the um, statistics um, and targets for fatal fire casualties and non-fatal fire casualties. Um, the annual target for H6 non-fatal fire casualties um, seems particularly high compared to the the, the, the incidents um, over the past four years, um, and you know, in the interest of setting smart targets, um, you know, are the fire service going to be looking at what the target will be for future years, um, in comparison to 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 to, to historic incidents? Uh, thank you, Councillor Barrett. Uh, this is one of the things we do during our, our uh, planning days at the start of the year. What we will do, we will feedback. Uh, we'll, we'll review the results that we get for the whole year and uh, when we uh, get provided with the national reduction figures, we will look at these reduction figures and uh, apply it locally. So what we'll be seeing next year is that, that number reducing greatly uh, and that will reflect on our performance over the last three years. Thanks very much. Thank you. Uh, we're now into comments and I see Councillor Shires has a comment. Thank you, Vice Convener. Um, I was interested to know on page 19, I think it is, of the report, um, and this is something I've raised at committee before about um, wildfires, Muirburn, and uh, fires that take place out in the, you know, the more extreme parts of uh, Perth and Kinross, where we've got, you know, um, smaller um, fire cover, etc., and the pressure that can put on. Um, the fire service out in those areas. I'm really encouraged to see this actually featuring in the report. Um, and I noticed it talks about national engagement, and I wondered if there was any local engagement with, you know, the NFU or uh, landowners federation, etc. Um, because it is something that does cause concern to those of us who represent some of the, you know, vast rural areas of Perth and Kinross, and we know how quickly these things can escalate, um, and quite, you know, can be quite a long way from. Uh, for fire appliances to get out to, to put it under control. Thank you very much, Councillor. Um, we do have a national strategy for wildfire, and um, I think Ewan is probably best placed uh, to take this question as Ewan is one of our wildfire uh, tactical advisors, um, is well versed in the national strat strategy and also the, the local approach that we take. So Ewan, I'll let you fill in some of the detail on that. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Councillor Shires. Yes, uh, we're doing. We have uh, the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service has undertaken a national stra uh, wildfire strategy, and uh, we're one year into the strategy and its review of all our wildfire capabilities throughout Scotland. 
Now, the, the, the full review of the, the wildfire strategy has been taken uh, with regards to the amount of incidents that we have, we have undertaken over the last 10 years within Scotland. And it's no surprise to where we see a lot of the wildfires. And these come from the, the northwest of Scotland, coming down the east coast, coming through Perth and Kinross, and that there's like a lazy S shape coming down into the, the uh, the borders, the Scottish borders. So Perth and Kinross features heavily within this area. Now I'm a, I'm one of one of the members of the of the wildfire strategy, and one of my my uh, roles is to liaise with uh, land managers, uh, developing fire plans, etc. For estates. So. It's quite early days with regards to the engagement that we're having directly now, but we're going to see that uh, increasing greatly now that we've got a, a template for uh, fire plans for estates and landowners, and we will help them uh, set up a, a forum themselves. So it would be neighbouring estates, because a lot of these estates have uh, numerous amounts of resources that they can utilise themselves and we would just be coming on on board to support them. So there's a lot of work getting un undertaken and uh, and it is getting getting a uh, reviewed locally as well. So Perth and Ross is a key part of that, Councillor Shires. Thank you, Vice Convener. My apologies for for putting in. I see when it should have been a queue, and my internet is so slow. It's just nonsense today, um, and I promise that I didn't set Mr. Beard up for that question. <laughs> um, but you know, it's something that I have been conscious of that you know that the estates thinking about you know um, Highland Perthshire, um, Eastern Perthshire, etc. They are really well set up, and it's really good to hear that there's you know that we're finally sort of really grasping that one and working with them uh, to develop to develop strategies because you know gamekeepers and, and various other people they know the land that they're working on better than anybody. Um, so it's really good to hear that partnership approach that's been taken. Thank you for that. Thank you very much. Um, we were in comments, but I take it since I've seen no more queues or C's for comments coming up. Um, thank you very much for your report. Um, it, was a, a, it was a good report for the quarter, uh, and I'm sure, as you mentioned at the beginning, um, there's two consultations coming up, and I'm sure uh, elected members will take part in those consultations. So are we happy to uh, note the report? Agreed. Thank you very much. We move on to item 4.2, which is the Perth and Kinross Local Policing Area Quarterly Report for 1st of January to the 31st of March 21. I'd like to invite Chief Superintendent Todd and Chief Inspector Binney to introduce the report. Thank you, Councillor. I'll not take members through the detail of the report. They, they have it to hand and they'll um, undoubtedly ask questions. I just wanted to draw um, members' attention to the report itself is obviously against the police plan um, and, and I trust that on your page 40 it demonstrates how our local priorities link into our national outcomes as a service, bridging that divide between local and national, but also under each of the main priorities it also demonstrates how our plan supports the Perth and Kinross community plan. C clearly if there's to be any change in the community plan we would need to review and refresh our own local priorities, ensure that they continue to remain valid and that they um, also tied into the national outcomes um, that are sought. I also just wanted to touch on, so this is quarter four's report, but the figures within it uh, are the year to date for the entire um, fiscal year or business year for, for policing. Um, clearly an absolutely extraordinary year for us and a very difficult year um, not just in, in demand perspective, that's um, consistent with all public sector over the last year, but very difficult to actually draw some conclusions uh, as to crime from the year before because the profile of um, the community um, and uh, they are out and about um, much, much different, much reduced. And so we're looking at a lot of the one to 10,000 um, figures as a more comparable indicator. But I would just ask for members um, forbearance around their ability to compare and contrast the current year just passed uh, from a crime figure perspective with, with previous years, um, but happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Chief Inspector Benny, do you want to say anything? I know. Thank you for the the invite, convener. I'll just. I'm quite happy to take questions along with Chief Superintendent Todd. 
OK, thank you very much. Are there any questions on the quarterly report? I'll just give it a little bit more time because of the IT issues. Councillor McEwen, you have a question. Yeah, thank you very much, Vice Convener. The, on page 51 of the report, it goes on about domestic house breakings. And although these are at an extremely low incidence in Perth and Canoss at 4.45 per 100,000, the actual detection rate is very low as well, it's just, just under 18%. I just wondered if there's any advice for homeowners, et cetera, that could actually improve this detection rate, because I know it's a, it must be very frustrating to have your house broken into and then the actual, there's not a, a positive outcome uh, from that. So I'm just wondering how we can improve that 18% whether stuff that the homeowners, homeowners themselves could do or there's uh, something that the police could prioritise differently, I don't know. Yeah, thank you, Councillor. I'll, I'll ask um, Graham just to comment upon that, but I would just um, make the point that detection rates for domestic housebreakings have always been notoriously difficult, yeah. with a, a, a huge degree of emphasis upon eyewitness or forensic uh, capability. So um, it, it's we're not outliers in that regard, but I would agree with Councillor that they are too low, and we always seek to have those improved. Um, so Graham, if you want to give any update locally as to what we're doing in that space, please. Yes, um, no, thank you for the question. It's probably fair to reflect that in the last year we've seen a slightly different profile with domestic housebreakings uh, reduced potentially partially because more people have been at home. Our, our attention has been has been to provide safety advice for other types of acquisitive crime, which we've seen an increase in like break-ins to sheds and break-ins to, to vehicles, or most particularly thefts from vehicles which have been left open. Uh, there are lots of, um, I'm not an expert on, on crime prevention, physical crime prevention, but there are lots of, of people within our organisation who, who are in our community teams are able to provide that uh, focus should it be needed. So I'm quite happy to, to entertain any any questions or any requests for specific advice around households particularly and it might be something that we need to consider as our working population returns to office space um, it has probably been less prioritized than, than other types of acquisitive crime but I, I accept the challenge and and we'll be willing to push some more attention into that area should we need to you know the the one thought I had was whether with technology improving as we go on, whether installation of household CCTV, et cetera, is something that, or whether these sort of newer type doorbells that record uh, people, are they, are they beneficial to the police or are they, are they just too low a quality and not provide you with the evidence that you need? No, both uh, is the an sorry, Graham, yeah. that one, but bo yeah, both is the answer to that um, question. They can be of good quality. They can be very helpful. We do CCTV um, trolls, if that's the right phrase, when we have an incident, because we don't have that many, thankfully, domestic housebreakings. Clearly, within yeah. the more rural area, it's a it's a greater challenge, and we'll use other technology available to us to perhaps identify which vehicles were within an area um, and that might lead us towards specific individuals. Um, but the trouble, of course, is identifying somebody at your door and then proving that they actually broke into the shed um, or the house it, it are two separate stages. And, uh, and it's the latter stage is the one that presents the greater challenge. More often than not, it's, it's close by in possession of the property. Um, but we also have uh, some challenges w with certain um, members of our community who probably have a good idea who broke into their house and the reason for it, um, but they're not quite prepared to tell us. They'll tell us it's been broken into and what's been taken, um, but not perhaps who did it. So that presents a real challenge for us as well. Um, so no, I, I mean, the use of de um, deterrents such as CCTV alarms and the like um, are absolutely welcome. Um, undoubtedly, and they can provide some additional advantage to actually detecting uh, the crime or where it be committed. But I would look to them to more wards as a deterrent rather than a catch somebody once they've done it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, convener, you have a question? 
Yes, thanks, Um it's, Regarding speed limits, as you know, many of our villages uh, now have a 20 mile an hour speed limit in place. Uh, many locals and visitors, of course, uh, where there's no pavements are walking the roads, and cyclists as well, I presume, expecting um, people to obey this limit or at least try. Um, but we've been finding that um, for most of the time, uh, people are coming through these speed, uh, speed limits well above 20 miles an hour, ignoring it completely. Uh, we've been fortunate to have the police here in Bridger Cali uh, several times, but they seem to be more uh, along the lines of educate rather than enforce. And I'm just wondering now these limits have been in place, are we now able to start enforcing these speed limits, having the police there to actually issue penalty tickets rather than just educate, because that doesn't seem to be working. Um, I, I, I hate to use the term zero tolerance. I'm, I think that's a bit unfair because uh, you know there has to be a little bit of leeway because not every speedometer in the car is accurate. But are we now in a situation where we should really now be enforcing these speed limits? Because uh, I know many local people are annoyed about it uh, and are trying to wave traffic down themselves and that could put them in danger. Thank you, Councillor. The 20 mile an hour limits are quite um, a challenge, I think, for all of us, not, not just within the police service. There are some clear Scottish government guidelines around the introduction of 20 mile an hour limits, and they are expected to be self um, enforcing um, limits. So the, the, the um, challenge we have as a service is um, 20 limits put up and then just the responsibility to ensure that people observe them pass to the police. Um, who have an enforcement um, responsibility. As we know, engineering, education, enforcement in that order, um, zero tolerance brings no justice. So we have to allow the officers and staff to make the discretionary decisions uh, at the time when they stop people. So I certainly wouldn't move and wouldn't push to move towards um, a um, compulsory of everybody gets charged for, for breaking a 20 mile an hour limit. But what I would expect is that if we have an individual who's perhaps carrying a hefty number of points for speeding, um, then we'll send them to the courts who might take their license off them as opposed to uh, just give them a warning because clearly they've been charged three times previously and had those. But I, um, I, I am speaking with the local area commanders and all three um, of the local authorities within Tayside around our approach to the 20 mile an hour limits and also um, linking back into local authorities as to you know, what measures were put in place around the, before we introduce the 20 mile an hour limit, there needs to be adherence to the Scottish Government guidelines of what that actually means. It's not just a lowering of the 40 or the 30 mile an hour limit. And I'm not convinced that all of my staff and the wider community recognise what follows the, these introductions, but our colleagues in roads policing clearly are. They're very, very uh, particular around their capability and, and in regards to your own area, priority route for them and they're up there all, all of the time. Um, so it, it is a, it's a more complex area than it actually presents, uh, but nonetheless, people need to be charged and reported or have points in the license, they will get that. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I, do, I do agree that zero tolerance is probably unfair because, as you say, there has to be some leeway, but um, it would be nice to see um, more enforcement, I think, up here because I think that there, there could be potentially a danger uh, for people who expect cars to be coming around bends at a reasonable speed. And of course, it doesn't happen where well, there's no pavements, of course. But but thank you for that anyway. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Convener. Thank you very much. Councillor Peter Barrett, you have a question on the report? Uh, yeah, thanks, Vice Convener. Um, with regard to um, violence disorder and and antisocial behaviour, the report um, advises um, you know some of the actions um, that have been taken with regard to um, Operation Stung. Um, I was wanting to ask whether, um, in the light of recent incidents, um, Operation Stung is to be um, scaled up or or intensified. Um, I passed on reports to Inspector Binney this morning um, about an incident reportedly involving 40 youths in the in, in the North Inch last night, um, and we've heard of similar incidents in the in in, in the past. So the, there is clearly a, a problem. Um, I'm aware that you know the community safety team uh, and other voluntary sector partners and the police are all working together to try and and and, and deal with this. Um, but I'm wondering whether there are sufficient resources being uh, devoted to this if we're getting reports of that scale of incident. Thank you, Council. I'll pass that to Graham uh, as local area commander, and he'll outline his proposals going forward. Yeah, no, thank you, uh, Councillor Barrett, for the question. I'm, I'm aware of the incident, which I think was Saturday night. We were, we, there was officers there within, I haven't had a chance to respond to you. There were officers there within three minutes of the call uh, and, and dispersing that crowd. We, we uh, Operation Stung, as you know, had started due to a weekend 
couple of weekends of significant violence. So, so curbing that level of violence has been, uh, I would regard, a success. Um, you have have uh, articulated well the the coalition we've tried to build, and yes, every weekend we have resources dedicated to uh, to congregations of people potentially in public spaces, particularly young people, and as well as visitor management and other areas. But uh, there is there is a recognition that the other demands sometimes uh, compromise that ability to retain that that attention as much as we would like. So we are not finished with Operation Stung. What we've done is obviously push into the space of trying to get as many resources from as many partnerships out on the ground. And I've done a lot of work with um, with young people themselves to try and look at the views of young people so we don't create a wedge between policing and our younger communities that that causes us damage going forward. We've we've done a lot of work with the schools and I've been really pleased to get back into the schools with an officer we've we've appointed as a local liaison officer and we've done public podcasts as well just to 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 make sure we uh, understand um, the public can understand what we're trying to do. It's a difficult balance for me because on one hand you know the, the punitive aspect of of trying to deal with violence and antisocial behaviour, but I'm also trying to uh, push my officers to show a bit of compassion for those young people who who have uh, maybe had difficulties over the last year. So striking the balance has been difficult. We can continues to be one of our um, focuses and welcome as we always do any advice and support from from our elected members. Um, but. Um, we uh, will be one of our priorities moving forward just to work on on our confidence between the police and young people and also try and maintain as much as we can those patrols along with uh, with uh, our partners in Perth and in fact the wider the wider county. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Shires, you've got a question on the report. Thank you. Thanks, Convener. My question was actually very similar to Councillor Barrett's. Um, I think I'd like to thank, but uh, start by thanking Mr. Binney for the very um, proactive and very personal attention that he's given to this issue. Um, it could potentially have really kicked off um, big style across Perth, thinking Ross, with young people who really have taken the brunt of uh, some of the lockdown restrictions over the last year, and, and I think officers have handled it uh, for the most part really well, and, and that is we're we're grateful for that. Um, my question was about how we're going to build that. I think you referred to it as the coalition um, between the various different um, public agencies that you know that are, have resources, um, some more limited than others, uh, to actually to, to really build this, Graham, over over the particularly the summer months when when I know that there is a concern. Obviously, the weather will be as it's been this weekend for the rest of the summer, not. Um, but, you know, that combination of, of hot days, alcohol and um, people ha still having restrictions on how they can congregate um, may be a challenge. And, and some of the more rural areas where, where our policing numbers are limited, how are, we, how are you going to uh, put resource to the various different communities? That, that I suppose, is a concern uh, on top of the visitor management um, issues that we've got around lock sites, etc. No, thank you for that. Um, and we, you know, we within the police, we've tried lots of innovative things um, to try and re-engage with young people. We've we've uh, around schools, but that that doesn't deal with the the potential risk periods or over a weekend. Um, in terms of our uh, response and our resilience. Um, we have made some uh, adjustments to our community policing model designed to try and respond to some of the um, the risks we see in our more rural areas. Uh, that is just taking shape just now. And what I've been trying to do is to try to build a closer relationship between all our community sergeants. So if we have an issue in a particular area, then we can flex that community response um, across the county. Uh, maybe if there, you know, we need to 
put resources from Perth north or we need to bring resources from the south into Perth to deal with particular issues. That would be my priority because you're right, we need to try and maximise the number of the amount of resource that we have available. And we do have, we have used quite successfully our uh, uh, national teams that have been available uh, to for us to use bid for and they have been patrolling more particularly with the visitor management, but we have used them on, on occasions for for the sort of public space congregation issues. So there are a number of tactical options available to us, notwithstanding the, the youth engagement teams and, and the street pastors and YMCA, just to, to name three which who have worked with to try and give us a bit of support. So uh, that's probably what uh, I would highlight the changes to, change. to, changes to our, our community model so we can be more flexible with the resource that we have on the ground, particularly at weekends. OK, thank you. I believe uh, Jackie Pepper has got a comment. Thank you very much, Vice Convener. It was really just to um, emphasise uh, what uh, Mr Biddy was saying in relation to the, the um, connections across the partnership with Community Safety, the Youth Engagement Team, which is the new team, so it's additional resources that we have put into this and that we anticipated that um, we would need to have this in place uh, not just uh, um, when we came out of um, restrictions, but right through the summer and up to October. So the investment in that youth engagement team allows that flexible deployment across the whole of Perth and Kinross um, uh, in, in terms of their, their the peripatetic nature of the work that they're, they're doing along with our police colleagues and Universal Youth Services. In addition, um, we also have um, uh, COVID uh, monies from the Scottish Government to provide some holiday activities over the summer. So we're currently um, uh, putting a plan in place uh, in, in, um, to provide some alternative um, meaningful uh, activities for young people. But I think one of the things that we have to um, just bear in mind is that there's one thing about young people wanting to get together and to do that in the way that they would normally do and to do so peacefully and that, that we don't um, uh, demonise young people for wanting to do that. So we have to um, make sure that we're supporting them to be able to, to, to engage with, she, with each other safely and, to, and to, to have those social activities that they've been missing. So it's getting that balance right as, as um, uh, Graham Binney was 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 saying just uh, a few moments ago. Um, so it's engaging with those young people and getting that um, the, the the right the right tone and the right style and the right approach there. And I'm hopeful that um, our youth workers, alongside our police officers and community safety and universal youth um, organisations, will um, uh, engage with young people in the right way. So thank you very much for allowing me to comment. Thank you, Jackie. Uh, Move on, Councillor McCall, you have a question. Thank you, Vice Convener. Um, before I ask my question, I just want to endorse what um, Jackie has said there about uh, young people want to meet and gather together. They've had a long time and they've not been able to do that. So I think we just need to bear that in mind a little bit. We're all young once, believe it or not. Um, my question really is on page 65 of our pack and the section on domestic abuse and sexual crimes. Um, I note that you comment, uh, Chief Inspector, that the, we've seen reports from third sector of increases in domestic abuse, um, and yet there has not been any more recorded crime. So I'm just wondering whether or not there is some reluctance of potential or victims or, you know, people who have who have gone to the third party charitable organisations, but there's some barriers or resistance to them coming to the police. Um, so that's the one part. And my second part, if I may, Vice Convener, on the same same page is that I notice you've uh, tailored your engagement model to talk about these issues with youth groups in an effort to make them, especially young women, feel safer. But since the vast majority of domestic abuse and indeed rape and sexual crimes and in fact murder against women is, is pre predominantly perpetuated by men, I'm just wondering what tailoring you've done to your engagement model to um, help young men understand what is appropriate and what's inappropriate behaviour and attitudes towards women. Thank you. Thank you, councillor. Uh, in, in regards to the, you know, the barriers to resistance, absolutely they still exist. We we know that, um, and 
and we work incredibly hard with partners and advocacy services um, to break down some of those barriers. And, and tragically, what we find is when matches are reported to us, they often are at the tail end of a litany of previous uh, activity that hasn't been reported. Um, th there is a consequential impact on our figures uh, that fall out from that because the one incident reported may actually generate 10 or 15 crimes, and that can be in, a, in, in sexual violence as well as in other domestic violence. So we do know that that's there, and we work incredibly hard, as I say, with advocacy services and, and colleagues elsewhere. But it's a victim-centred approach, and if the victim doesn't want the police involved, then, th then that will be respected. We will do our level best to try and um, mitigate any risk that that potential perpetrator presents or continues to present to, to, to new uh, potential uh, victims or to the current victim. So we do work very hard and I think we make continual progress, but it is still a, an area where um, it's quite disgraceful, frankly, how much does go on. In regards to um, your very pertinent question around what are we doing in regards to the actual victims themselves, that, that, that is a challenge. It's a challenge for society as to you know what are we teaching uh, young men in schools what are we teaching them in their uh, their first employment um, and what are we teaching them as civic leaders and and um, a, across the, the wider uh, society um, it's not something policing is going to crack on its own but what we do have is a range of tools and a range of uh, abilities uh, tactics as graham would say to us um, around a multi-agency response so that if we have a, an offender that's moving on to a new victim uh, or a new relationship, we can choose to disclose that pre that offender's previous history to their new partner, even if there is no evidence that that partner is a victim. But to allow the partner to make the necessary um, judgment based upon the information that's been provided to them. So that um, duty to disclose and duty to tell um, is enshrined in legislation. Uh, there's a whole process wrapped around it, and our detective superintendent with colleagues um, will assess and make the necessary decisions. And all of that is in regards to our, our um, again, right to life obligations. We need to be really clear that people's lives are at risk sometimes in these relationships and we have every every duty and responsibility to minimise um, any potential to that victim. But the actual challenge for us uh, changing that behaviour, we can only play a part in everybody else's efforts and it's for all of society to play a a part in trying to change those behaviours and what society, what that um, group of individuals may think is norms in society, because they simply aren't norms. Thank you. I, I was real. I, I completely accept everything that you say, and I do accept as a, a societal issue to address. But I think when you're having engagement models with young people, particularly in schools, um, that's really where I was trying to get at: is, is what what message can we give to young people be, so we're preventing them becoming perpetrators rather than reacting once they become perpetrators no thank you i think schools is an excellent location uh, where we do still have the opportunity to influence behavioral change before it's formed in its entirety and maybe just ask graham to touch on what we're doing within schools but out with schools is where the complexity really rises for us graham yeah thank you um the answer to what we're doing in schools is probably not yet enough because we haven't quite figured out what that approach needs to be my reference to was to um was to information suggesting that the, the way we approach this with young people, particularly at the start of secondary school, probably needs a review. We do a lot. And I, I don't know if Jackie has anything, she might be able to assist me with this, but I feel, and we have had lengthy discussions, that we do an, we do an awful lot in schools, but do we have the, the, the knowledge and the analysis to determine what is successful? And that, that has always been something that I've hung on to. And I just make the comment about uh, two things for me about safety. You're absolutely right. Most of the, the significant risk comes in private places, but we need to make sure people feel safe in public. And if that is maintaining safe places and the visible police and partnership presence, then that should be a priority. But also to look to see whether we're doing the right things in schools targeted at the right age group. We're not alienating young men, but we're asking to, them to take some part in in, in, uh, in appreciating um, misogynistic behaviour and the impact on, on, on young women particularly. So I think the answer is we're not quite there yet, but, but that's something we're very aware that, that we need to work harder on. Thank you very much, both yourself and Superintendent Todd, or Chief Superintendent Todd. Um, and I look forward to perhaps seeing updates on that in future reports. Thank you. Thank you. Jackie, do you want to come in on uh, anything? 
And I'm not sure that I can add much to what Graham's already just said, but I, I, I'm just thinking um, that actually this might be something that the Child Protection Committee would be interested in doing some evaluation on in terms of the longer term impact of the the um, range of activities that um, Graham's um, outlined that's currently underway in schools, but that might be something that um, could come forward in due course. Thank you. <clears throat> and I do know that RASAC um, have young people uh, working in the schools on that subject, so um, they may be able to help a bit more as well. Um, I don't see any more questions in the queue, um, so we'll move on to comments. Are there any comments on the report? Councillor Peter Barrett, you have a comment? Yeah, thanks, Vice Convener. Just um, very briefly, and it was in response to the comments made by the uh, convener at the start of the, 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 the meeting, and far be it from me to um, accuse anybody of grandstanding or, or, or showboating. Um, but if the convener is going to write to the Justice Minister about the number of police officers, <clears> and <throat> then perhaps he might want to include the leader of his own party within that letter, as the Conservative manifesto for the Scottish Parliament elections just passed, did not include any proposals to increase police officers by even one full time officer. Thank you for that. I don't see any more comments, so are we happy to note the report? Happy to note. Agreed. Thank you very much. Convener, back over to you for the rest of the committee. Thank you, uh, Vice Convener, and uh, I can just uh, continue my thanks for the police and fire service for the work they're doing in obviously difficult circumstances still. So thank you very much. Uh, we move on now to item five, uh, which is the community payback orders annual report. And if I can ask Jackie Pepper to introduce the report, please. Thank you very much, Convener. Um, this report provides an update on community pay payback orders for the period 2019 to 20. And you'll know that a community payback order is a community disposal of the court um, and that can set out requirements depending on the offence and uh, set conditions aimed at preventing reoffending. These orders are managed by criminal justice social work teams, specifically the public protection team and the unpaid work team. Criminal justice social work remains committed to improving outcomes for people within the justice system and an annual report must be prepared every year on how community payback orders are working within the local authority and include what unpaid work has been carried out and how it has helped the community. This report for Perth and Canross was submitted to Community Justice Scotland in December 2020. In 2019-20, we saw a slight and positive increase in the numbers of uh, community, uh, sorry, community payback orders compared to 2018-19, and a lower proportion of community payback orders were revoked, and just under three quarters were completed successfully in 2019-20, which was an improvement on the previous year. The appendix sets out the extensive contribution of unpaid work delivering high quality work which is of social benefit to the citizens and communities of Perth and Kinross. The report visibly demonstrates through the photographs how this work endorses the principles of community payback. The report also highlights the work of the public protection team and the developments within the men's service which now has a base at the Nuke in, in Perth with 12 men engaging. And this uh, just heard recently that this project has been renamed by the men themselves and will now be called Evolve. That's Evolve. And also uh, contained within this report is some information on the One Stop Women's Learning Service, better known as OWLS, um, which has continued to evolve and seek opportunities for women to not only reduce their offending, but to improve their mental health and well-being. It also includes um, a, a narrative on the uh, uh, a Caledonian programme, which has become more embedded in practice this year and has proved to be a well utilised disposal by the court. This work is challenging, but it has also improved the protection for victims of domestic violence and the support to children um, affected by this. I'm pleased to advise that the committee that Scottish Government have recently confirmed that funding for this programme will continue beyond next year. 
Criminal justice social work has continued to operate as an essential service throughout the pandemic. However, we recognise that the impact of the pandemic has meant that for 2021 will be quite a different year in terms of the report next year, with the suspension of court sessions and fewer orders being imposed. There have also been restrictions in the way people can carry out unpaid work with smaller numbers and work having to be carried out outside, outdoors. And there was a period of suspension between January to April uh, this year on the advice of the Chief Medical Officer. We will bring back a report in 20, uh, to dealing with 2021 as soon as is practicable after that, after that report is submitted to Community Justice Scotland. I, Nicola Rogerson, uh, Service Manager for Criminal Justice and Roddy Ross as the manager of the unpaid work team are, are here today and happy to take questions on this report. Thank you, Jackie. I'll open up now to questions from members. And Councillor Bailey, you have a question. Thank you, Gillian. Uh, um, thank you very much for the report. Most informative. I had a good read of this one. Um, Given that the general direction of travel in Scotland is away from short custodial sentences and towards more things like community payback orders, why do we think that we're seeing fewer community payback orders over the period here? I'm looking at the numbers from 2017 up until the year before this, and there's a net decrease in the number of orders, although I appreciate that the number of hours within many of the orders is overall increasing. What, what are your thoughts on that? I think there's been a slight de decrease um, in answer to your question. Um, but, but overall, if you look at it from, from this year compared to last year, it's 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 um, uh, we're seeing a kind of slightly uh, healthy increase there. Um, and I think some of that is about um, confidence in um, the ability to uh, carry out these orders and for those to be um, the, the relationship with the, 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 the courts and confidence in the courts. And I think that's building. And I know, uh, Nicola, you may want to come in in terms of your uh, relationship with local sh sheriffs and um, discussion with them. Actually, I could, uh, Jackie, I would echo what you're saying there. There isn't really anything that I can add to that. Um, the conversations with the sheriffs, sheriffs are that they are pleased and they are happy with, with the, with the work that we provide, and certainly the team in criminal justice. And um, certainly, we'll see from uh, the Caledonian program, etc. There. They are making longer orders, but um, I think that's in recognition that they are confident in the work that the team carry out. OK, thank you for that reassurance. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Liz Barrett, you have a question. Yes, um, thank, thank you very much for this report, uh, Jackie and Nicola. It's very useful and very interesting. Um, I'm just looking at page 100 of 152 of our papers about the Caledonian system um, and just wanted to ask what is um, joint delivery of two to one work with male perpetrators, please? Nicola, can you ask that, answer that one? Thank you. Certainly, uh, the two to one work is the preparatory work that takes place prior to the prior to the perpetrator going on to the programme. Um, obviously, there has to be assessment, very clear assessment about what's required and um, what areas of work that they need to focus on. And, and it's in order that they are, will have a more successful um, completion of that programme and it will be targeted to what their, what their, what their needs are. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, I'm not seeing any other questions coming up in the box at the moment. I'll hold on for a second. No, nothing else coming through. So uh, if I can sum up then, uh, this paper presents an update over the period 20. Oh, no, hang on, I shall stop. Councillor McCall, you have a question. Apologies, thank you, <laughs> convener. It was uh, dry there. <laughs> it was it was a little bit it was a little bit slow to come up the question. Um, um first of all, thank you for the report. It's very helpful. My question really is about capacity going forward. And while that's not referenced in the report, I am aware that there is a considerable backlog in court cases, and uh, therefore the um disposal of sentences, I suppose I don't know if that's the right phrase or not. So I'm just wondering what um, the plans are going forward to cope with the anticipated increase that's likely to come once the court services get fully back up and running. Thank you, Councillor Nicole. Um, 
we actually have done, we actually have been preparing for that, recognising that there is a backlog and we have estimated that it will take between three and five years to actually get back to the point where we, where we were pre-COVID. We've been very, very fortunate, um, as have other areas in Scotland. We have got additional funding from Scottish Government, temporary, uh, but that has allowed us to employ further staff, which we're currently doing just now, um, to help uh, reduce or to help cope, sorry, with that backlog of work. Thank you. I'm just assuming that the figures for next year then will have some reflection on that increase to come in due course. So I look forward to that. Thank I you, Nicola. Thank you, Councillor. Um, oh, sorry, Jackie, did you want to come in? Yeah, I, I'm just just due really to uh, exercise a wee bit of caution there, Councillor McCall, because I don't think the figures will come through to the following year, which will be um, into to, to, to year 22. OK, 20. thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I'll hold on just any, in case any other questions so I don't get caught in mid-stride again. No, nothing, nothing coming through. Right, then I'll sum up. Uh, this paper presents an update over the period 2019 to 2020 with regards to the operation of the community payback orders within Perth and Kinross, which in themselves cover a wide range of options such as unpaid work requirement, compensation requirement, mental health requirement and drug or alcohol treatment requirement. During the period, 353 new orders were handed down by the court on 311 individuals. The paper details further statistics for information, however, worth pointing out is that the number of unpaid work requirements has fallen again in this period, down to 271, continuing the trend from previous years. But the average number of work hours imposed has continued to rise to a figure of 142 hours, which also follows the trend. Other community payback order requirements such as compensation and mental health treatment have seen a slight reduction or have stayed relatively stable, but we have sadly seen a sharp rise in alcohol treatment requirement. It will be interesting to see how all these figures fare in this year's report or future year once the impact of the COVID pandemic comes into play. The figures also show a fall in failed CPOs now down to 309. The attached report at Appendix 1 gives examples of the work carried out by the unpaid work team, comments from those undertaking unpaid work and responses from those beneficiaries of the service of the, un of the unpaid work team. It does make for good reading and shows what can be done. Other items include the work and training that takes place at the West Bank Hub, first aid and cardiovascular preparation of special note. Work by the one stop Women's Learning Service, OWLS, is also detailed and they should be congratulated for raising £200 at their first Macmillan coffee morning. It is impossible to comment on every item in this report, but while still work in progress, nonetheless, the efforts being made here to hopefully make people's lives better should be recognised. Members were asked to uh, the recommendations, accept the recommendations in sections 311, uh, 311 notes the report undertaken by the payback protection and unpaid work teams in respect of the community payback orders in Perth and Kinross for the year 2019-20 and 312 requests the Chief Social Work Officer to bring forward a report regarding the activity and performance of community payback orders for 2020-2021, which also sets out the impact of COVID-19 restrictions. I'm going to move the report. Um, I hope the last convener will second. Thank you very much, convener. Uh, yes, this is a good report and shows the good work carried out by all involved. It's good to see the number of orders that have been revoked going down. Um, having visited West Bank House a number of times during the reporting period, it was good to see the work carried out by the team and the scope of opportunities open to clients of the service. And as chair of the Community Justice Partnership, it was good to discuss that work being carried out at West Bank House with the Cabinet Secretary for Justice during his visit last year prior to the pandemic and highlighting the opportunities for clients to gain industry standard qualifications that will help them once they've completed their orders. Recommendation two of the report requests the Chief Social Work Officer to bring back a report for 2020-21. This will be challenging due to the suspension of work during the lockdowns and continues to be even so now. Even more challenging will be moving forward, as we have heard, when we'll see the backlog of cases going through the courts and the predicted increase of orders arising from that. I'm also glad to see that the men engaging in the Caledonian system have engaged enough to rename that system, the new, to evolve and hope to see success in that in that system as we've seen in ours. Uh, I'm happy to second the report. 
Thank you, Vice Convener. Um, I'll open up now the comments. If you can put C in the box for me and Council McEwen, you have a comment. <clears throat> Thank you, Convener. Yes, I just like to positively comment on this report. I think that community payback is one of the most positive things we do in the criminal justice system. You know, crime doesn't always need a punishment. It sometimes needs support and help. Uh, and I think there are many examples in this report of where uh, working uh, collaboratively, we have helped individuals uh, achieve something better for their life rather than a life of crime. And I think that is a, a, an extremely important and constructive uh, thing for us to do and be involved in. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, I'm not seeing any other uh, comments coming through. Uh, and there seems to be no amendment, so I'm going to ask that we can agree the paper. Agreed. 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 Thank you very much. We'll now move on to the next item on the agenda, Community Planning Partnership Update. Um, Mr Haxton, I don't know if you wanted to make a short report or just go straight to questions. I've prepared some notes, convener, if you'd like me to quickly. Yes, please. Through. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, yeah, this is the um, Housing and Communities uh, update from the Community Planning Partnership covering the period from February. Um, the paper is split into three main sections. The first section considers the Local Outcomes of Improvement Plan and the Community Planning Conference, outlining the background to the development of the new light from the middle of last year and reminds committee of the board agreement to focus on five new strategic priorities, which are outlined in paragraph 1.2. It summarises the outputs of the Community Planning Conference, which took place at the end of April, and the next steps for the development of the, the replacement LOIP, and the final version of that will come to full council in September, if all goes according to plan. Uh, section two is on the Community Planning and Development Plan, which is a statutory requirement and replaces the previous plan, which was approved in 2018-19. It sets out the status of the plan and its aims, um, as well as its links to the LOIP and the Perth and Can Ross offer, and a finalised plan will be brought to committee before August for approval. The third section um, focuses on the Community Investment Fund and sets out the current position with £600,000 available in this financial year. And a full report with the recommendations for delivering that fund is to be considered at the SPNR committee on Wednesday. Uh, but happy to take any questions. Thank you, Lee. So I'll open up to questions. If you can put Q in the chat for me, if there are any questions. Councillor Stewart. Thanks, Peter. Um, as I'm uh, uh, suffering power cut, just tell it just to our mobile camera or present the bandwidth. Um, my <coughs> question was um, uh, a couple of questions, I think. Um, uh, what was the section on the um, community? I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, Councillor Stewart, could you speak up? We're, we're having trouble hearing you. All right, sorry. Um, questions on the LOI. Um, the Community Planning Partnership um, 1.3 says that there were 100 voluntary partners contributing to the conference. And uh, 1.4 says that one of the things was um, in the night to see. Uh, and I just wondered what, what sort of, uh, who were, the sort of general spread of colleagues and partners. What were some of the improvements and outcomes? I'll come back to my next question. Lee, could you hear that all right? I think, if, if I may repeat, I think the question was around who was in attendance at the conference. Is that that's what I. That, that's what I heard. Yes, I think that was it. OK, um, uh, David and Claire are also on the call and, and may wish to contribute, but uh, in general, we had representation from across the Community Planning Partnership Board and the Executive Officer Group. We had um, colleagues from a variety of council services who are already undertaking work in relation to those five priorities. And on their recommendations, we also asked a small number of um, active community organisations to take part in the conversation as well. Thank you very much. Um, I hope that was satisfactory, Councillor Stewart. Because that... uh, thanks. Yeah, that's yep, the, other, the, the other part of it was just um, uh, that first question was just um, in 1.4, it's talking about the improvement in outcomes we wish to see. And obviously, I know whether we will get that in Deloitte, but just um, for a flavour, what sort of improvement in outcomes? Um, are, are we talking what sort of measurable 
improvements that we're looking for. I'm happy to take that question. I see that Claire was also wanting to make a comment. I don't know if Claire wishes to cover that. Yes, okay. thank you, Lee. I, I think just in response to uh, the first question as well, Councillor Stewart, in terms of the information that the um, the conference event was considering a couple of weeks ago, that was very much informed by a COVID community impact assessment that was undertaken. So the information in terms of determining the priorities that formed the workshop sessions uh, was very much determined by feedback that we'd had from community representatives community representatives as well. So very much informed by how people were feeling that they'd been impacted on by uh, COVID and how that was impacting, affecting them in order to determine the community planning partnership priorities for uh, the year ahead. In terms of the question, and Lee or David might want to come in with a wee bit more detail on this, in terms of the questions around and about the measurable, Im measurable impacts, We've set up uh, or planning to set up a short life working group that will take forward these key priorities. And as part of that short life working group, we'll actually start to determine who's leading on the groups, what activity have we already got underway and what will be the measure of success? What difference will the work of the, the community planning partnership make? Uh, we've already got some outcome targets in place for a number of areas, particularly, as you will be aware, round and about uh, child poverty and indeed some of the fuel poverty activities. And we're currently working up uh, some wider activity around round and about a good food strategy. Um, employability, as you know, there'll be lots of outcomes that we've already got through the Child Poverty Working Group, but likewise that will sit within some of the activity round and about our economic wellbeing plan. So as the group, the Short Life Working Group is established and the, uh, the new LOIP is developed, there will be a range of measurable uh, outcomes that will be set within that going forward. Lee, I don't know if there's anything else or David that you would like to add to that. I just uh, yeah, that's what all I'd say to that is is the the key, the key for the LOIP is for the actions to be um, actions that only the board can deliver, and just make sure we don't have um, kind of what we would call business as usual, which is things that services or agencies can do independently. And um, so it is capturing that, that what are the the joint actions that the community planning partnership board can make to address. Those, those key issues that, um, that Lee and Claire have outlined. Thank you very much. And thank you, Claire, for coming. I was going to call you in after, the, after Lee, but never mind, you've done that and answered all the questions. Um, so it's Councillor Waters, you have a question. Thank you, thank you, convener. Uh, just taking forward the, the, the LOIP a wee bit and, and the link in with the Community Investment Fund, which uh, I, I understand the paper's coming forward in a couple of days. Uh, to the relevant the relevant committee to make a decision on that. Um, reg regarding the community investment fund and the the, the allocation of that money, um, which I think you know very much uh, in the paper, I believe looks at, at delivering the the five strategic uh, uh, priorities of the LOIP. Is is is, there, is all the community investment fund earmarked for that, or is the is the the community investment fund more more uh, looking at the the whole Perth and Kinross offer, of which the LOIP is a part of? Lee, can you come in now, David? Yeah, I'm I'm happy. David may want want to Thanks. chip in as well. Um, yes, uh, Councillor Waters, that's that's that, that's the the ultimate intention of the community investment fund has always been to seek to address local inequalities. Um, and we feel uh, on, on balance that the local outcomes improvement plan identifies what those inequalities are at a relatively high level. So there is scope for any applicant to demonstrate how their project will make a positive impact on those issues. What we have um, proposing uh, to consider on Wednesday is that there's a kind of a, a tiered approach to that. So uh, first off, applicants are asked to consider the overall themes of the offer and identify which of those themes they'll feel their project is most closely linked to but then to go into a bit more detail and specify how their project will impact on the inequalities linked to that theme. I hope that makes sense. Can I just 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 clarify then so, so that basically yep. there will be a there will be a, a, a requirement for any application to come in to hit one of these feet, the, these these five 
these five uh, strategic uh, aims within the law. Yes. Yes, that's correct. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor McCall, do you have a question? Thank you, convener. I think uh, Claire Mailer has already anticipated my question and answered most of it. My question was really to say, had there been any baselining done on the five key priority areas and what to be measured against? But it sounds like the Short Life Working Group will be establishing all of that. So I withdraw my question. OK, thank you very much. Um, I'm not seeing any other questions coming through at the moment. No. OK, I'll just do a very quick summary on it. This paper is the regular update of the. Oh, sorry, it's another question. If you have <laughs> Councillor Stewart, you have a question. Yes, it, it, if you like, it's um, kind of a, a follow on from Councillor Waters. Um, question, so. We're approving or being asked to approve the criteria for. Uh, the Community Investment Fund on Wednesday, but won't have the new void until um, September. We've got a final draft of the, the void coming uh, to uh, the CP4 Council in September. So I'm, I'm wondering how the Council would change that uh, or input into that final draft before it's asked to approve it. But also, just in terms of the answer to the question about the, the priorities for the Community Investment Fund and aligning those solely with the Lloyd, um, or with the, 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 the themes in the Local Outcome Recruitment Plan, um, isn't, you know, the Community Investment Fund is also supports the offer. The offer is not necessarily about um, inequalities, but about, um, you know, uh, sharing decision making and, and Budgets with uh, the budget, budgetary decisions with communities, um, and also about helping communities to do things for themselves, which is not necessarily the same as as the inequality focus of the of, of the LOIP. Um, and I just wondered what, what what the you know what the alternative what what um, provision is there for that alternative focus in terms of communities becoming. Uh, resilient and, and, and more um, uh, self um, self reliant. Uh, Lee, can you come in on that one? If you could hear it, all right. Yes, I think I think I got the gist of that. Again, David and Claire may wish to to say more. Um, in terms of the the, the timing, the the Community Planning Partnership Board um, agreed the, the the high level priorities in December. And that was uh, presented to Council uh, earlier this year. I can't remember recall like, which exact committee it was. So all, all we're asking or will be asking on Wednesday is for the committee to consider the use of those high level um, uh, priorities as part of the criteria for assessing applications. There will be, of course, opportunities to input into the detail of that. And that's one of the key focuses of the short life working group going forward. In, in terms of the, the question about um, communities bidding in for applications on kind of more broader themes. Um, what I would say to that is that the five strategic objectives, although they are more focused than the previous um, uh, key focuses of the uh, previous local outcomes improvement plan, I st we still feel that they are broad enough that would allow a community group, for example, if they wished to bring forward a proposal that talked about um, uh, growing community capacity and taking uh, greater control over decisions, etc. Uh, within the community uh, concerned, then there's an obvious link there to the skills, learning and development strategic priority within the proposed five uh, priorities for the new LIPE, where they could demonstrate that their project helps to build skills and uh, learning within the community in, in, in order to allow them to do more for themselves. Um, I don't know if David or Claire wish to say more on that. Uh, I'd, I'd agree with that, Lee. I think, um, I think that the, Framing the loop and the priorities and the, and the uh, the ease of the offer um, allows community groups the opportunity to demonstrate how they're going to meet those and and I think um, you know the 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 headings for the loop the priorities for the loop um, as as Lee says you know will allow groups to articulate how they're going to contribute to them and there's lots of different ways of of, of going for that I mean if we looked at the you know mental well-being um, some of our rural communities have 
very much said that's you know for them it's about isolation social social isolation so um we feel there's, there's enough scope in there for for a good range and quality of applications to come in thank you both um i'm not seeing any further questions coming through but i will hang on again just in case Nothing further this time, so I'll just quickly summarise. This paper is a regular update of the work of the Community Planning Partnership and at the same time under the COVID restrictions. A short life working group was set up to review the impact of COVID-19 on our communities and from this will be derived a new local outcomes improvement plan. Five strategic priorities were agreed for the revised plan, such as poverty, physical and mental well-being, skills, learning and development, employability, digital participation. An online conference has been held to look at what is being done and what must be done to realise collective ambitions. And the final draft of the plan should be put before Council by September. The Community Investment Fund, popular since its inception in 2018, is to be open again now with a fund total of 600,000 and again for community-led projects. However, we await a report to the SPNR committee, which will be considering how greater equity can be brought into budget allocations and what changes need to be made to criteria considering the new improvement plan mentioned earlier. The paper also details work being done on the new community learning and development plan, aligning it with the Perth and Kinross offer and the improvement plan. At this stage, members were just asked to note the paper. Are we happy to note the paper? I'm assuming we are. Happy to. Uh, yep, thank you very much. There's a comment coming through from Council McEwen. Thank you, convener. The community plan and partnership, I think, been a great thing. I think it's very sad that the administration has provided no extra funding for it this year. I know my own East, East Persia Action Partnership, which covers wards one, two and three, currently have £30,000 left to spend for the whole year. And whereas we're sitting now with a SIF fund of £600,000 between the whole areas, and I think uh, I think it's becoming ridiculous. I think that the and the criteria now seem to be identical between the two ways of funding it. You're just going to, and the oversight, I just seen that there's, there's just confusion now. I've only half read the paper for SPNR, which I'll be on on Wednesday, uh, but there seems to be complete confusion now from the administration what the community plan and partnerships are for and what SIF is for, because they seem to be for the same thing now. Uh, it looks like the administration just put the money in the wrong pot and are trying to work their way around it. I don't, I don't know. I'm, we'll probably find out on Wednesday when the, the real paper about all this, because we'll be trying to discuss a paper that's not even at this committee. Uh, so, so it's getting quite confusing now uh, what the administration are trying to do here. Uh, but I suppose the light will come on Wednesday when we discuss the full paper that Mr Haxton's letting for the SPNR committee. Thank you, Councillor, and ho hopefully you will be enlightened on Wednesday. Thank you very much. Uh, there are no other comments coming through. I'm assuming we're happy to note the paper. Thank you very much, members. We're now sitting at uh, 20 past 11. I'm going to suggest we have a, a short comfort break uh, for 10 minutes, and I will suggest we reconvene at 11.30. Thank you very much.
Thank you, members. According to my clock, we're now back at 11.30. Uh, I'm assuming everybody's here. Oh, the screen's gone. Okay, I'm assuming we're all back on, on board. I believe we have, uh, instead of a normal introduction, we're going to have a video for this paper, which is uh, item seven, housing contribution statement. And I think Audrey's ready to run the video for us. Thank you. Here in Perth and Kinross, we want to support people to lead healthy and independent lives. One of the main aims of the Perth and Kinross Strategic Commission Plan 2020 to 2025 is to support people to lead as independent, healthy and active lives as possible in their homes. People who experience ill health or have a range of supports and care needs due to mental health, homelessness, learning disability, age or substance misuse issues often need suitable accommodation and supports to live independently. Housing plays a vital role in driving down health inequalities. A good house to live in is one of the foundations of a healthy life. High quality housing also enables people to be empowered to live independent lives at home or in a homely setting, avoiding the need for more costly health and social care. We already have a good range of adapted accommodation and support options for people when they need help. Our second housing contribution statement supports the development of future supported accommodation for people who need it in Perth and Kinross. The housing contribution statement has been developed in partnership with housing and health and social care practitioners. It sets out how the local housing strategy can support the delivery of the health and social care partnership aims, ensuring people have access to suitable housing and support to enable them to live as independently as possible. It also meets the aim of the Perth and Kinross offer, providing partners with a meaningful platform for people and communities to work together to take the decisions that affect them. Over the last 12 months, we have seen some notable successes, including in 2019-20, we exceeded our annual new build target of 550 units by delivering a total of 861 homes. 215 households moved into new housing, which is designed to meet the changing needs of households, including those with temporary or permanent physical disabilities. Working with our partners, we also ensured residents and tenants have access to services to enable their homes to be adapted to meet their medical needs. 159 major adaptations were carried out in private homes and 95 major adaptations and 257 minor adaptations were undertaken to council tenants homes. During 2019-20, a new multi-agency independent living panel met monthly to consider referrals and assessments for people with particular support needs who required suitable accommodation and supports to live independently. An accommodation guide to independent living was developed to support people to understand the types of supported accommodation available and how to begin the process of accessing independent living. Feedback has been very positive, with families feeling they are able to make more informed choices and decisions about housing and support. We have also invested in good quality housing, as this has a direct impact on the general health and well-being of households. In 2019-20, we invested £8.7 million to improve our council homes. Evidence suggests that people who were living in homes which met the national quality standard resulted in 39% fewer emergency admissions compared with those living in homes that were not upgraded. Alongside this, we have also invested and developed our sheltered housing services responding to issues affecting older people such as dementia, social isolation and loneliness. A focus on inclusive living ensures accommodation and support can be accessed and used by as many residents as possible. As a result of our hard work over the last 12 months, many people have been able to access housing of a type and in an area that is suitable for their current and future household needs. We are enabling them to live independently at home for longer, which has had a hugely positive impact on their health and well-being. This is just some of the work we are doing. However, the ageing population of Perth and Kinross, along with increasing demands for complex adaptations to existing homes and for specialist housing means there are challenges ahead. 
we have developed a plan with our partners for our services and delivery models to ensure we will remain in a good position to meet those challenges so that everyone in Perth and Kinross can have the housing they need to live independent and healthy lives. Thank you very much for that. That makes for a good introduction to this paper. I'll open up now for questions. Um, I actually have a question myself. I may, I may start the ball rolling. Um, and it follows on from um, a visit the last convener and I had on Thursday to a new build at 6 Milne Street. And we had a conversation with the um, project manager. And we were talking about the energy efficiency of the building. Uh, and he was saying along the lines that um, you can't just hand the keys over to something like this, uh, a property like this anymore, because it, you have to know how to run it. Uh, and, and the idea of what he was saying was that if the windows are closed, if the window vents are closed, if the doors are all closed, uh, the, the flat in this instance almost becomes somatically sealed. And there was a concern that if that continues, uh, there's a build up of condensation. And I'm just wondering whether certainly in the first few uh, months or, or, or time, uh, months, uh, uh, weeks, that we will carry out visits to check these properties to make sure that people are running them correctly and aren't um, encouraging condensation and, and, and other problems. Um, is that a situation we can have? Claire, I think you can answer me for that one. Thank you, Councillor Braun. Yes, uh, absolutely. I think I think as obviously was explained to you uh, at the visit last week. Um, you know, with the energy efficiency that I think the maintenance of the house and the tenants responsibilities as well as us as a landlord are absolutely key. Um, we undertake, as you're probably aware, um, the let when we let the property in hand over the keys, um, our housing officers go through in detail uh, a range of areas covering the tenancy, not least actually looking after the property and their responsibilities in these discussions in terms of you know how to avoid dampness and condensation. We also have settling in visits, so a number of weeks after uh, the tenant has moved in, housing officers go out, they undertake a settling in visit just to check that the, the new tenant's happy settling in uh, within the tenancy uh, and check to see if there are any issues. And we also have fairly detailed information with regards to um, all of the different sort of, you know, heating controls and whatnot and, and wider issues around and about the tenancy. We have a, a tenant's handbook that each new tenant uh, is, is handed at the, the outset of the tenancy that covers many of these issues. So yes, a uh, fairly, fairly detailed overview that is given and close contact with tenants uh, in the early days and weeks uh, to ensure that they're aware of uh, how to live in and look after their new home uh, to make it as enjoyable as possible. Thank you for that, Claire. It's just there's a it's, a it's a completely new concept of housing, really. And I said there were monitors inside the, the rooms, for not just for carbon monoxide, but for carbon dioxide, uh, and that needs to be ventilation. Um, Councillor Barrett, you have a question. Councillor Peter Barrett, I'm picking. Um, thanks, convener. Um, with regard to um, housing supply, on page 124 of the pack, it makes reference to the target for uh, wheelchair accessible properties in the forthcoming year being being six. Um, that seems a pretty low number to me. Uh, and although it goes on to say that that target will be reviewed as part of the local housing strategy, um, I would have thought we'd have had a pretty good handle on what the demand for wheelchair accessible properties was um, and what sort of level do we need to be building at in order to to, to meet that um, and my second question convener um, regard relates to page 141 um, and the um, heaps abs award for 2021 which it said was recently announced um, which will allow us to carry out works covering Pomerium and Potter Hill Flats external wall insulation. Um, I wanted to know if that um, part of the report was accurate and are we in a position to carry out that work? So I raised this matter at the uh, full council meeting at the start of April and we certainly weren't in a position then to give that um, sort of uh, undertaking. Claire, were you coming on that? Thank you, Councillor Barra. I, I will respond to the, the first part of the question and maybe pull in Elaine if I've missed any detail and then Nicola will 
give a response in terms of the HAPES ABS and progress in that respect. So in answer to the question with regards to wheelchair adapted properties, uh, I would stress that we, uh, as you'll see from uh, the detailed report, we've got an independent living group. We have got a very good uh, handle on current and future need for properties. Over and above the new build and the new build target, we also obviously will do major adaptations and you'll see details within the report whereby we will adapt existing properties to ensure that they are wheelchair accessible. Uh, it certainly is an ongoing um, area that is under review to meet uh, existing needs. So it's a combination that is certainly the, the target for uh, new build properties, but over and, that, over and above that, we also will do adaptations to a property, an existing tenant's property, property and indeed uh, we may move somebody uh, from an existing property to a more suitable wheelchair adapted property that we already have within our is existing stock but absolutely it is a continu continually uh, evolving picture whereby we're continually assessing needs as they come through the independent living panel to ensure that these needs are being met uh, and if we need to exceed the target then I, I would absolutely assure you uh, that we will do that. Elaine I don't know if there's anything you want to add on that point and then we can hand to Nicola for the, the heat Sab's question. Yeah, just to confirm that's correct. It's based on our modelling tool and that's based on our social work assessments. We've done a lot of modelling, so that target of six comes from that information. But just to say um, from the 1st of April till just today's date, we've actually brought back six fully wheelchair adapted and two of them were in Milne Street. So we've actually exceeded our target today. So it's a although it's a tar target, we're extremely flexible and we need to be because it needs to be person centred and person led. Nicola, would you be able to come in and answer the second part of the question, please? Yes, thank you. Um, on the HEAPS ABS application, the, we, we still have to make a, an application for the funding, even though there is a, 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 a pot of money set aside by the Scottish Government. So we're actually waiting to hear back about the finalised amount. But the aim was that they were going to be providing us with 1.68 million. With regards to um, Pomerium and Potter Hill Flats, the, the multi-storey strategy is moving forward. We are still looking to, to include the external wall insulation for those properties within the coming year. Um, and we are looking at getting some additional resources pulled on to try and move that forward. Thank you very Thank much. You very much. Um, Council McEwen. Thank you, the convener. Uh, on page 111 of our report, it talks about adaptations to properties. And I know that build, our new build properties are built deliberately to allow us to adapt them uh, for different needs. A couple of years ago, there was a housing uh, conference that was held at the Horse Cross, and they were talking about technology as well as things like ramps and handrails. And I just wondered how much technology we were now putting into the homes to support our tenants. Thank you, Councillor McEwen. Yes, there was a, a tech conference a couple of years ago and certainly the, the housing service, as you'll see uh, detailed within the report, are progressing a number of areas regarding tech enabled care. We've got the smart flat at Carpenter House, uh, which gives sort of uh, a good overview of all of the different technology that is available. Uh, and we certainly have invested through our, our tech in housing to ensure that that assessment is made. Our occupational therapist, again, uh, mentioned within the report undertakes these assessments along with our housing officers and indeed our housing support team. Elena, I don't know if you've got more detailed information in terms of some of the, the wider uh, activity around and about technology. Yeah, I can add to that, Claire. <clears throat> um, in terms of tech, we've embedded that into our assessment process. So in terms of when staff are assessing somebody's needs, tech's embedded in that. We've done quite a lot of training on staff as well, and we've got champions. So in terms of referring for tech, we've made over 2,000 referrals, and tech can cover a multitude of things, such as alarms, motion and door sensors, bed and chair sensors to even Alexas and pedometers. So yeah, it's still relatively new, but we are using it and it's part of that holistic assessment that we carry out and it's part of the independent living panel and all our support officers are trained in, in identifying in terms of tech needs of people. 
Can I can I just quickly add to that that page 135 of the report gives a little bit more detail in terms of what Elaine has just provided an overview of. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Council McCall, you have a question. Thank you, convener. Uh, there we go. Um, sorry, my technology isn't working too well. Can you hear me? I can, can you hear, hear you, yeah, fine. Oh, yes, very I can good. Hear you thank fine. you. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. First of all, I would like to um, thank uh, Claire and her team for this report. It's very welcome. It's good to see the progress. It seems like a very long time ago, Claire, that we had these very early conversations about more integrated approach with health and social care to housing needs and allocation. So it's really rewarding to see some of this now coming to fruition. Uh, my question is, uh, well, I actually have two questions if I may convener if there's time. The first one is around, I notice that on page 130 of the report of our pack, you've mentioned there's a new noise app uh, being, being deployed. Um, noise is one of the biggest issues I have from council tenants. Um, and I'm wondering, do you have any statistics about the number of noise complaints that are received and how many that are actually resolved? Because most of the cases I have for a noise uh, detector is is provided it's inconclusive or it rarely results in a, a resolution for the person who is suffering the noise from their their noisy neighbors uh, and if i may ask that question i have a secondary question on tech if i may please do well, over there. thank you very much uh, again i have uh, i've visited the smart flat in uh, carpenter court and it's very last year and it's very good so if anybody hasn't done that i would encourage them to do so if it's still available to them but my question really is about we have the independent living panel that includes uh, representation from certain you know, people who perhaps don't live in council properties, but who for whom the council has uh, uh, perhaps a duty of care. I'm thinking of people, for example, with learning disabilities who may live in uh, housing, you know, housing association properties. And is the support to become tech enabled that's available to council tenants also available to those uh, residents of Perth and Kinross? that the council supports. Claire, could you lead on this? Yes, thank you. And again, I'll probably uh, bring in Elaine for a little bit more detail. In terms of the first question and uh, the noise app, I would say that the, the noise app has been uh, a very successful um, addition to, uh, I think, the tools in the box that the, the housing officers and indeed the, the Safer Communities team have, uh, because as you know, we previously often used the, the noise monitoring machine and tenants uh, and residents had to wait for this to be available. So that certainly has been uh, a huge help in terms of uh, gaining information uh, much more quickly and indeed has led to improved performance uh, from our point of view in terms of responding to uh, and resolving uh, neighbour issues such as the one that you've described. Uh, in terms of the, the tech question, what I would also say is absolutely yes, we work very, very closely with health and social care colleagues. Uh, so the facilities that we've described with yourself there that are available to our council tenants are also uh, widely available to uh, wider tenants and residents within the, the private sector. Uh, and that is very much led. Uh, they have got an officer within the health and social care partnership that leads on all of the tech enabled care within the partnership and links very, very closely with our team through the independent living panel. Elaine, I don't know if there's any other comments that you want to make on that. I was looking for the stats yeah. for noise performance, but I can't find them. OK, I've got them here. So there was over 195 people registered for the noise app. And out of that, 78 cases are still under investigation, but 81 were actually investigated and closed. And one went on to an antisocial behaviour order. So I appreciate your feedback in terms of that's a common occurrence in terms of noise, but it's a really good piece of tech that we're using. And it is getting some outcomes that we're closing cases cases down, some are reoccurring, but there has one that's went on, quite a serious one, and we've, the evidence from the app has been allowed us to actually get an antisocial behaviour order, so um, the noise app has proved really, really helpful for us and our tenants. 
In terms of the tech, yeah, Claire's right, but our support officers just don't provide support to council tenants. We've got a generic support team that provides support to a tenure neutral. So what I mean is tenants in either the private sector or RSLs, and we just recently seconded two support officers to work within the RSLs and the private sector to make sure that they've got access in terms of the support and assessment. So what I described before in terms of the assessment, that tech element within the assessment is offered to those individuals as well. Thank you, Elaine, for both the stats and for the information on the tech. That's really helpful to know. I wasn't aware of that. Um, and certainly it's something I will pursue uh, because I know a number of people who could probably benefit from that who are not council tenants. Uh, the noise app, I'll also speak to you separately. I have a few cases live just now that I perhaps might need the app to be deployed in because it seems to be going nowhere fast. So thank you for that too. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Massey, you have a question. Yes, thank you, Convener. Uh, my question relates to Appendix 1, uh, pages 1, 2, 4, 2, 5 uh, of our PAC uh, regeneration. Uh, I'm really pleased to be made aware from the report that 139 empty properties within Perth and Ken Ross area have been brought back into use and fully agree with the benefits this brings to the community. The, the report states that the Perth and Ross Council provides advice on related grants or loans to help bring these properties back into use. Uh, my question is, other than the advice of, on grants and loans available given by the vacant property team to the owners, are there any financial costs incurred by Perth and Kinross Council to bring these properties back into use? Claire, would you like to lead on this one again? Elaine, I was wondering if you could come in and, and give a response to this one. Well, the, the team that provide this support are also, that's not just their main area in terms of they also do our rent bond guarantee scheme. So any financial cost is absorbed in terms of um, that they work on other areas within the team. So the grants that we provide are just about feasibility studies and advice and assistance. And quite a lot of that is through email communication. But the team also work in terms of um, if when a property does come back into use, there's a guarantee that we can use it through a rent bond guarantee scheme, which which then allows us to accommodate somebody who's coming through the homeless route or provide a wider housing option to that individual. So it's not just their own remit, it's just not one area that they focus on. They've got quite a wide remit that they carry out. But that, can I follow up on that? Certainly. Uh, it's not, I don't really think that's answering the question. What I really want to know is uh, does the council uh, give funds, does it cost the council money to bring these properties up to standard? Yes, because we're providing the grants that we, the, the grants that we provide um, comes from our second council tax monies um, and that's the monies that the council gets in through people having second homes. So that's the, that's what provides the grants to these individuals to bring these properties back into use. Right, thank you. Sorry, I misunderstood your question, Councillor Matthew. Claire, would you like to come in with a comment? Yeah, can I, I, I'd just like to add to that. I, I certainly think, you know, through some of the work that we've undertaken through the Empty Homes Initiative to bring properties back into use, we've got a very good arrangement in place whereby these properties are then meeting housing need within the area. So bringing empty properties up to standard and bringing them back into the use are just one of a number of measures that we're um, working on uh, and, and through some wider private sector initiatives to ensure that housing need uh, in the area is met. Uh, and many of these initiatives, along with our new build programme, uh, our common housing registered and some of the wider work, our buyback scheme, collectively are ensuring that we're in a good position to meet housing need within the area. Uh, and you'll see some of the outcomes that we've got detailed within the report. And our home first is you know, one example of those. So the expenditure in terms of supporting uh, empty homes in mean Brock brought back into use and delivering uh, properties and homes for people in the area has been hugely successful. So the outcomes of these uh, are fairly significant. Yeah, thank you for that. Thank you, Claire. Uh, Councillor Liz Barrett, you have a question. Thank you. Thank you and many thanks to Claire and the team for the report. Um, I think many of us are very proud of what is achieved in Perth and Kinross through housing and 
Thank you for that. Um, I, I have two questions if I may. Um, one is relating to page 125 again, just to ask what progress is being made towards identifying um, X retail pro properties in, the, in our town and city centres that could be converted back into housing supply. Um, and the other relates to page 130, um, again about antisocial behaviour. Uh, I see that uh, 90, nearly 95% of cases were resolved within the local target. Um, I just wondered if you could tell us what the local target is and since you're being so successful with it, will that be made more stretching? Thank you. Claire, would you like to answer on that one? Yes, thank you, Councillor Braun and Councillor Barrett. So with regards to the question in terms of ex-retail properties, absolutely, we work very, very closely uh, with Peter Marshall and indeed David Littlejohn Little through the, the economic development team and are certainly looking for uh, every opportunity to bring uh, properties uh, back into use. So absolutely, that continues to be um, a priority and certainly sites within the town centre and regeneration of the town centre, we have got a contribution to make uh, towards that. So the teams are always seeking out sites, uh, other properties, and we've got a number of examples where we, we have had properties uh, that we've, we've brought back into, back into use. Uh, Elaine, would you like to pick up? You probably have got the detail at your fingertips in terms of the antisocial behaviour, so I'll probably give um, a more precise answer than I will. Yes, no problem. So our target is to resolve it within 20 days and that's something we're currently reviewing. We've just undertaken um, our, our ARC submission return and that's looking at um, our ARC return to the regulator. And once we do our submission, we look at our target. So that's something that we're potentially are going to look to review in terms of your comment, making it a bit more pushed. Uh, but yes, it's a 20 work working day target to resolve the, the concern that's been raised. Thank you, that's great. Thanks. Thank you. I um, just wonder if there's any more questions coming through. Um, while we wait and see if they yeah, do. I've got I, a question, convener. Um, uh, it's just not popped up in the chat. OK, box. Councillor Stewart, go ahead. Yeah, um, so it's a question about the um, second recommendation in the paper um, that the committee agrees to the proposal to integrate the contribution housing makes towards the delivery of the um, health and social care partnership strategic commissioning plan. Um, I've, I've been through the, the, the paper a couple of times and I'm, I'm not quite sure what the specific proposal is. I thought that the general tenor of the report was that we are already um, integrating the contribution that housing makes. Um, so is there any clarity around if, if there's a, a further specific proposal here? Claire, would you be able to clarify? Yes, uh, can I just add, we, we have a requirement, um, the housing contribution statement is a statutory requirement set out in the, the guidance to support public bodies joint working that a statement must be made uh, and be included uh, as that housing contribution statement. So uh, our intention will be to take this report and what I would say is this report we had hoped to bring a number of months ago, but obviously with COVID uh, we haven't been able to do so, but this, we will be taking this report onto the IJB and there is always a statement that gives a high level overview of housing's contributions. So uh, it's just a, a, a formality in that respect. So, so there's nothing specific in terms of a, a proposal to to further integrate or or anything like that? No, it, it's a contribution statement, just as you've described there. It's about what housing's contribution is to supporting uh, the wider outcomes of the health and social care partnership. OK, thanks. That clears that up. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Um, I'll just wait to see if there's any other questions. I have a question that's come through on email to me um, from one of our regular tenant representatives, uh, Lynn Palmer. Uh, and again, it relates back to Six Mill Street, but would obviously relate on to other properties built that way. Uh, and she's just querying about the sound insulation and 
heating insulation between um, between flats, between ceilings and, and floorboards above. Um, and I believe the bias convener might put me right on this, that this came up in conversation uh, when we were at the visit on Thursday, that there's a considerable, considerable amount of insulation, both heating and sound between the, the floors. Um, but Claire, just wonder if you could just confirm that to us. Uh, thank you, Councillor Brown, and indeed thank you, Lynn, for your question. Um, yes, absolutely. I mean, obviously, it, Nicola might want to come in with a bit more detail, but in terms of sound and heating installation, uh, obviously, uh, high standards uh, are met uh, in that respect. And obviously, we've, as you've described, I think, um, Councillor Brown, with you, your earlier comment about Milne Street in terms of, you know, the properties become quite sealed units and are, are very energy efficient. And equally, uh, the sound insulation uh, measures are quite high. I assume that Lynn will be asking that question because we do know that in some of our older properties and we, as we've talked about today, I think in terms of the noise app, uh, there are some areas whereby uh, we've undertaken or required to undertake some sound insulation works. Uh, Nicola, I don't know if you want to comment specifically on Milne Street and sound and heat insulation uh, standards within these within the building. Yes, thank you. Um, just really to say that um, we are trying to exceed where possible the, the current build and regulations and those are being addressed to, to try and raise the energy efficiency in, in future um, upgrades of the, the, the building regulations. So energy efficiency and sound insulation are always one of the things that get reviewed by the building standards. Um, and given the, the targets for net zero carbon and moving to reduced energy demand in properties, energy efficiency is quite high on the priority list for everyone. But these are very well insulated properties and come alongside that comes the air tightness, which um, is where the, the issues potentially around the, the, the carbon dioxide levels and these monitors come in. So it, it is having the awareness of the tenants for that. The sound insulation is always one that is difficult in flatted properties, but um, we, we are complying with the building regulations on that one also. Thank you very much. Um, I haven't seen any further questions coming through. Uh, so if I may, then I'll go to summarise. Uh, this is a comprehensive report which outlines the important contribution made by housing in delivering the health and social care priorities in Perth and Kinross. It shows how housing plays a vital role in enabling more people to live independent lives at home and for longer. We all know the importance of having and living in your own home for maintaining health and well-being, and that applies whether you have been homeless or have special needs or have a disability. This, the report makes for excellent reading, if I can mention just a few points. In the year 2019-20, as we've heard, 861 new homes were completed, exceeding the target of 550. And as a result, our target of 2,750 homes in five years was surpassed with a total of 2,761 in the first four years of the local housing strategy. The success of Home First is reflected again in this report, and whilst we have spoken about this in the past, everyone involved should be congratulated. It remains a standard which other authorities continue to strive to attain. Support for independent living has continued with 95 major adaptions to council properties and 159 to private homeowners with financial support from the Care and Repair Service. And during 2019-20, over 8.7 million pounds was invested to improve the condition and energy energy efficiency of our council housing stock which means that we have maintain a high standard housing quality standard pass rate of 96 percent against the scottish average of 94 percent and 82 percent of our stock meets the energy efficiency standard and gets an average of 81 percent these are just some of the brief highlights of the report, how it makes it clear that the work is not finished. There is more to be done and there, there are outlines in this of the next steps that need to be taken. Recommendations here on 5.1 is, is recommended that we as a committee note the contribution that the housing service has made to the implementation of the Perth and Kinross Health and Social Care Strategic Commissioning Plan 2020 to 2025 and agrees to the proposals to integrate the contribution housing makes towards the delivery of strategic aims within the revised health and social care partnership strategic commissioning plan and on that basis i would move the paper and would ask that the vice convener was second thank you very much convener 
Yes, there's little more that I can add to that, and I'm happy to uh, formally second the report. Thank you, Vice Convener, and I would ask if there are any comments. And Councillor Barrett, big Councillor Peter Barrett, you have a comment. Um, thanks, Convener. Um, I think there is a huge amount to uh, commend um, in this paper. I think the um, scope and variety of the contribution that housing make towards uh, health is is considerable and and really important and and, and vital, particularly in in tackling things like um, fuel, fuel poverty and mental health and 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 well being. Um, I think that there's a, a an awful lot in this report. Um, um, which is uh, proactive, uh, things like the uh, Think uh, Think Yes funds uh, 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 devolved locally um, are, are, are very important and, and act as a, a, an early uh, intervention and, and prevention measure to prevent things getting uh, 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 worse. Um, I think Judging from the the, the report that uh, you know it's a fairly complicated landscape with regard to um, um, a, a energy conservation uh, and insulation measures, um, and I think that the, the the team do an excellent job uh, in navigating through that and is supporting uh, tenants and residents to navigate through that, which makes a a, a real Im uh, impact on on uh, you know people's. A, a, a disposable incomes and what money that they have um, to, 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 to choose between heating or eating. Uh, and I think the campaigns that the council has has run uh, in terms of welfare rights uh, to, to, to address that um, are also commendable. So um, I just wanted to uh, congratulate all the teams in, in, involved in this. Um, and I think it's a, a very good report which demonstrates uh, the caring ethos, both of all the services, but also the council corporately. So well done. Thank you, Councillor. Thank you very much for that. Uh, I don't see any, any other comments coming through, so are we happy to recommend the report? Agreed. Yeah. Happy to recommend. Thank you very much. Uh, and we now move on to the last paper of the day, paper eight, which is the missing share schemes. And I believe Claire, Claire Mayle will introduce. Thank you, Councillor Brown. Uh, the report uh, summarises the level of disrepair in flatted properties uh, across the area and provides examples of typical defects causing building deterioration and an adverse public health impact on local residents, landlords and importantly on tenants. In most cases, owners can fund these communal repairs, but in some cases a minority of owners are either unwilling or indeed unable to fund their share or are untraceable, thereby, pre thereby preventing the necessary repairs going ahead. Consequently, as a result of this, there could be a, a decline in local private housing conditions and interventions required by a broad range of our council services. As enforcement action is extremely resource intensive, the missing share scheme proposed for a two year pilot aims to fund these minority shares to enable homeowners to undertake the necessary communal repairs themselves within a minimal impact to council services. The costs incurred in funding any missing share are recoverable from the owner via, re via a repayment charge attached to the title of the property, together with administration charges and reasonable interest. A missing shares technician is also sought as part of this pilot to ensure successful implementation and delivery of the scheme. The proposals contained within this report will enable a more preventative, a more cost effective and a proactive approach to be taken, contributing towards our overarching ambitions to provide good quality, sustainable homes within the area. I would stress that this report we had hoped to bring to uh, Housing and Communities Committee some time ago, uh, and I appreciate that some, some members of committee ha have been looking forward to seeing this report for a number of months, so I'm pleased to bring it to you today. Kirsty Stephen uh, from our regulatory services and myself will be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you very much. So I'll open up now to questions. Councillor Peter Barrett. Uh, thanks again, convener. I think just reflecting on um, Claire Mailer's final comments there, um, some members of this committee have been um, 
hoping that this report would come forward for a number of years, far less far less months. Um, can can you explain why this is only being taken forward as a as, as a pilot? I think from the introduction we received, there can't be any uh, downsides to this, um, and it is high time that we caught up with other authorities that are leading the way on this. Claire, would you like to lead first? Yes, thank you, Councillor Barrett. Uh, I would absolutely stress, I think the pilot in the first instance is, is to enable us to obviously put the arrangements in place with the technician, ensure that we've got the procedures in place and really assess, I think, the take up and indeed importantly, uh, the impact of the scheme. So I would anticipate that in a couple of years time, once we've undertaken a full, evalu full evaluation of the pilot, that we will be coming back and then have a better idea of the, the ongoing ask of the monetary value and indeed the resources needed to to deliver the scheme. So I think the pilot is very much to be testing uh, the overarching need and ensure that we've got all of the necessary arrangements in place. Kirsty, I don't know if you want to add anything, if you've got another uh, a further comment or to add more detailed information to my answer. No, Claire, that covers it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Waters. Thank you, convener. Just, just a question trying to understand, uh, you know, we, we refer to it as a majority share and, and, a, and a minority sh uh, share uh, for the missing share. And I think Edinburgh Council's uh, uh, paperwork that you sent the link through um, says that the, the, the applicant has to have 51% uh, or above of funding in their, in their uh, maintenance account before they will uh, do the missing share. Why? Why is, is there an importance in that being a minority or majority uh, that, you know, if we had a, a block of four flats and two council flats and two private residents who were possibly struggling to fund any any repairs, then then according to the letter of the the, the, the law and the, the sense of the, the, the paper would mean that they wouldn't be eligible for the scheme. Is there a reason? Is there a, a legal reason or another reason for that? Kirsty, would you better answer that one? My understanding is where it was mixed tenure, where you had council housing or social housing and also private housing, that the council would lead on that. This scheme is more so relating to just private housing alone. Sorry, does that answer your question? No, no, but I, the, the, the council, I've maybe it mixed things up with, with mentioning the council things. It was just the, the, the concept that, that you have to, before before the scheme will be operational, you have to have a majority of people yes. pay, 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 paying paying for it. Why, why is that? Why can't it be? Why, you know, is there discretion in that? If, if you got, you know, uh, even all private, you know, if it was only 50-50 and you were 1% out, of hitting the criteria of having a majority amount of the money already in the bank to pay for it before we would make up the difference. So it's the idea of why does that need to be a majority or is there discretion in there? It, 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 yes, sorry, um, it's normally that we would look for a majority um, that's detailed in the guidance, but absolutely there could be discretion with that. That's excellent, thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Liz Barrett. I think this is probably one for Kirsty. I'm just looking at the financial arrangements in section 2.5 to 2.8. Um, could you just confirm that the costs of attaching and enforcing the repayment charge to the property will all be recovered under the repayment charge? Yes, that's right. They will all Thank be you. recovered. Yes. Is that OK? Fine. Thank yes, you thank much. you. Fine, thank you very much. Uh, I'm not seeing any further questions coming through. I'll hold on for a moment. OK, then I'll just uh, sum up. We are all aware that repairs to flatted properties can be difficult when one or more of those properties is in private ownership. Owners may be absent and difficult to trace. And some may not have the funds readily available to meet their share of costs. What starts as a reasonably straightforward repair becomes delayed, which could result in further deterioration of the property and ultimately more costly work. This missing share scheme hopes to overcome that, and particularly where public health issues are involved, defective roof causing water ingress or dampness. 
in such circumstances, circumstances help to alleviate the problem and allow repairs to proceed quickly. Nonetheless, this should still be seen as a last resort option. It will always be the homeowner's primary responsibility to maintain their property and meet any commitments associated with it. The paper outlines a sum of 200,000 to be available over an initial two year period, the scheme up to be operated by regulatory, regulatory services and underwritten by the affordable housing earmarked reserve. Monies will be operated as a loan to the owner and secured by repayment charge on the property and usually payable over a five to 30 year period. A missing share technician will be employed to implement the scheme, a cost of approximately 40,000 per annum to be funded from the affordable housing earmarked reserve. Section 33 outlines the recommendations for this committee. It's recommended that the committee approves the implementation of a missing shares scheme to be operated by regulatory services for a trial period initially for two years. I'll move the paper accordingly and I've asked the vice convener if he would second. Thank you very much convener. I'm more than happy to second this paper. This scheme is something I've been after for a number of years as it's an issue that affects many residents in my ward and will address some of the real long outstanding problems in some of our owner tenant blocks. So yeah, I'm more than happy to second the report. And I will open up now for any comment. Then as there's no requests coming through, I will ask if we are happy to recommend the report as required. Agreed. Mm -hmm. Happy to do so. Thank you very much indeed. And that brings us to the end of this meeting. We've had just under just under three hours of, of meeting. Thank you very much for your patience. We've gone through a fair bit. Uh, thank you indeed and look forward to seeing you at the next committee meeting. Thank you very much indeed everybody and thank you officers.